Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul Levy returns to talk with Paul about his new book, Wetiko, Healing the Mind Virus That Plagues Our World. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and live their dreams. Now, here are the two Pauls talking about Wetiko, the mind virus that is killing us all. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, I have somebody I love and appreciate very deeply back on our podcast again. That's Paul Levy. Today, we're going to talk about Paul's new book, which is his second book on Wetiko, the mind virus that is killing us all, which is the title of our show today. And I really wanted to talk to Paul, especially what's what's going on in the world right now, as you all know, because he's a very deep human being with a lot of great insights. In his new book, I've I've studied his first book on Wetiko. It was very powerful. His new book's also very powerful. And I think it really is extremely important for all of us to be aware of what we're going to discuss today and what Paul shares in his book in far greater depth than we can go into in a podcast, but we're going to do our best to share as much of the key information. So I'm going to give you a quick uh, introduction to Paul. Paul has published several amazing books. One of my all-time favorite books, and I mean that (laughs) from the bottom of my heart, is The Quantum Revelation, A Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality. And uh, the quote from Sting on that book says it all. So if you want an amazing book that shows what quantum physics really means to the psychology of man and what our potential really is, I can't recommend that enough. His first book on Wetiko was Dispelling Wetiko, Breaking the Curse of Evil. He's also written Awakened by Darkness, When Evil Becomes Your Father. He's also written The Madness of George W. Bush, A Reflection on Our Collective Psychosis. And so we're going to dive into his new book today. And Paul, so grateful to have you back. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here, Paul. Really, thank you for the invite. My pleasure. I I love every minute I can get hanging out with you because you're the kind of guy that always somehow manages to stretch me and grow me. (laughs) So to begin with, um, Having read your previous book on Wetiko and read sections in your new book as well, there's a couple of words that will surely come up in our dialogue on Wetiko today. And I know you and I understand these words, but I'd just love it to, if we sort of set the stage. Could you clarify when you're using the word mind, what are you speaking of specifically? Because mind is like God, as you know, people have their own kind of compartmentalized ideas. So my goal is so that when when you use the word or when I use the word, that everybody understands what we mean. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, keep in mind, um, I'm a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner, and they, in the tradition I practice, they make a distinction between sort of the nature of the mind, which is mind with a capital M, compared to the contents of the mind. So on the one hand, There is the, you know, the conceptual, cognitive, thinking mind in its contents. That's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about mind. I'm talking about the nature of the mind. And it's really, you know, the source of the contents of the thought forms. Okay. And, um, so that I think it's an important distinction. And I can, I can write a book about that. Like the mind with a capital M is like space. It's like a mirror. It's formless, but it can take on any form, you know, but that's really in distinction to the actual contents. Right. I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I think it might be a working definition and you would agree with. Are you familiar with Dr. Dan Siegel's definition of mind? You know, I'm not sure. So please feel free to share. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, his, his definition, I think, is one of the best I've seen out there. Mind is an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. Mm. Well, that's cool. 
Yeah. When we're talking about big mind, of course, we're talking about subject-object relationship within consciousness itself, not our consciousness, but consciousness as a whole. But we are embodied, and even a, even a, a, a disembodied being that, like a, an Abraham that someone channels still is embodied in some kind of a mental sphere of energy, a vortex, or it wouldn't have any subject-object relationship. So I like that definition because it's an embodied and relational process that regulates the flow of energy and information. And we all know that how we use our mind has a huge influence on how energy and information moves through our own body. So the reason I'm asking is, is if, 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 you are, if you feel comfortable with that as a definition of mind, it would, might be nice for a person listening to have a kind of a concept, having not, a lot of people won't have studied Tibetan Buddhism and, and some of these deeper concepts of mind. I mean, of course I have and you have, but uh, anyhow, I just wanted to see what your thoughts were on that concept. Sure. Yeah, no, and that sounds great. I mean, and I think it's important because I've I've come across people who are spiritual practitioners and and I'll say, oh, everything is, you know, or this is the projection of the mind, and they think of the mind with a small m and it gets in the way of them really understanding what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, that was the key distinction I wanted to make. It's it's mind as the totality of process or the flow of energy information versus our mind, which most people associate with their conscious perception of themselves, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's what a deep rabbit hole. We could spend the whole, you know, talk today Two just hours. on that. Because, you know, the idea like, so we'll have thought forms and what I, what I really have been, have been tripping out on for decades is that, well, we so easily think that we're thinking the thoughts as compared to the thoughts just in a way are self-created and think themselves and are, and are just the display of awareness. And um, I mean, even in, in his autobiography, Jung talks about his encounter with Philemon, this being who lived inside of his, in, inside of his psyche, psyche that wasn't him, that knew more than him. And one of the things that Philemon taught him was that he said, yeah, you think that you think your thoughts in the same way, like if somebody came into the room, you know, or if an animal came into the forest, you wouldn't think you've created that person. No, that's an, an autonomous process that's happening, you know, in your, in, in your sphere of awareness. It's the same thing with our thoughts. We, there, we so easily not only think that we think them and then identify as the thinker, but then we absorb in them, we identify with them instead of just seeing them as just the display of the mind with a capital M, that those are radically different perspectives. Yeah. So in my conception, the universe itself is an expression of mind with a capital M. In other words, its thoughts embodied are what we call the universe, but our thoughts, like I'm hungry or I'm horny, or I need to go exercise, or what's the square root of 69? Those are our thoughts, which are in the collective sphere of mind. In other words, just like we might be picking up on the deer, someone in the room might be picking up on someone else's thoughts, not realizing that they're someone else's thoughts. Yeah, no, that's totally true. And, and sometimes I'll actually, you know, talk about that when we have the this recognition of our nature of who we are and that you know that we're interfacing with mind with a capital m we discover that we're inside of our mind with a capital m we're inside of our psyche and you know and a lot of even physicists have talked about like this universe can be likened to a thought form you know to a thought form that's materialized into the form of the universe but the actual um, substrate or source of this physical universe is you know consciousness or the mind with a capital M? Um, you know it's never separate from awareness. Our experience of the universe is never separate from awareness, and that's so obvious. But it's so obvious that we don't notice it. And then what does that mean? You know, and so because it's all all that I'm all that we're pointing at is pointing at this is a collective dream. That in essence was the experience I began having in 1981. But and I was so excited that when I began to share that 
you know, it, it so freaked people out because I wasn't integrated. I was just having this overwhelming realization. But that's, you know, this is what all the great spiritual teachers are, have been saying from time immemorial, that this is a dream, not metaphorically, but in a literal way that we're having a collectively shared dream. And we're such powerful dreamers. We've, uh, we're unconsciously dreaming up this universe to manifest in such a way that it seems like it's not a dream. And then we become entranced by our own creative genius. And that, in a way, opens the door. You know, my whole work on the mind virus on Watiko, that really opens up the door for understanding what I'm trying to point at. Yeah. Yeah. These are why I want to lay some of these distinctions down. I don't know if I think it was either James Jeans or Sir Arthur Eddington that said in his writings that the universe appears more as a great thought. Yeah. It's James Jeans. James Jeans. Definitely. Exactly. He was the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now then, when it comes to terms like the subconscious mind and the unconscious mind, I distinguish the subconscious as the wisdom of the body, the cells, and the DNA, but the unconscious as all the processes of mind, first starting with the personal mind, but then going out to greater realms of mind from the collective of the family to the society to the global mind. Etc. But the unconscious is everything that's happening under the radar of the ego, which is really only about three to five percent of our total perceptual range. So I'm just curious, how do those terms fit with you as we go into our discussion? Yeah, and I mean, and that feels fine. I'm very comfortable with your definition. I don't, I don't make such a you know a specific sort of distinction between the two. And I mean, I think of the unconscious, you know, when you study depth psychology in Jung, you know, he talks about the unconscious as the source, not just like Freud thought of just the repressed sexual stuff or whatever, but, you know, according to, to Jung, he saw it as the source of this wisdom and, and genius and, you know, and it can guide us and heal us. And, and I think of it in that way too. So, yeah, but I'm very comfortable with your definitions. Yeah, the reason I distinguish subconscious from unconscious is because I do so much work with people having problems with their bodies. So I have to show them how things like Watiko in your unconscious can enter your subconscious. So if you're in a if you're in this, shall we say, the state that you describe as Watiko and you're acting out negative thought forms or behaviors or any of those types of things, they then enter into your subconscious and it changes your heart rate, your blood pressure, your digestion, your elimination. So that's why I make the distinction because as, as a therapist, I have to sort of show people, you know, if you're not listening to your body when it tells you it wants to get out of a chair and move or you got to go poop, then you're not listening to your subconscious. But if you're not, if you're not working with your unconscious, as Jung said, your unconscious will always meet you on the outside until you meet it on the inside. And I think the work that we're going to get into with Watiko is really meeting your unconscious on the inside instead of having to relate to it from the events it's creating in the outside. Yeah, no, totally. And and that's and also one other thing, uh, Jung uses the word somatic unconscious. You know, I think the reference, what you're pointing out about the unconscious, you know, it's the mind-body interface. The unconscious deeply informs and gives shape to our bodies and our experiences of the physical realm. Right. Now, you and I have talked about this, but just for the, for the listeners, if you use the word soul or psyche, could you describe what you're referring to so that if that word comes up, they know exactly what you're yeah. referring and to? And that's another one of those words. Some people make a real distinction between soul and psyche. And, and honestly, I, I kind of go back and forth in a way that can conflate them in a certain way. And, you know, but as far as the psyche, I'm with Jung in that, you know, his definition is that it's the totality of all processes, both conscious and unconscious. And, yes, that, I, and I really feel that. And and when I when I use soul, I almost use it more as a poet. We're all it, it almost for me. It's it's identical with who we really are, the true nature, you know. Yeah, from the simple way I describe soul is simply consciousness within. In other words, everything that you experience inside yourself is in the domain of soul. And if you say, "Well, I'm thinking about 
uh, how I'm going to build my garden. Well, you're using the mind aspect of soul because you're thinking it on the inside, but you create the garden on the outside. So I totally agree with you that there's a lot of interchange. And I also think soul is a very good word poetically because it has you know, such a vast capacity to convey meaning to people on so many levels. Right, right, for sure. So with those distinctions out of the way, let's get down to it. What is Wetiko? Because if they haven't read your books, I think that's where our journey really big kicks off here today. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And so just in a nutshell, um, one way, well, first off, it's an indigenous term that this it's a native american term that connotes in a way the spirit of evil and um and you could say it's a psycho spiritual disease of the soul that afflicts humanity and it exists in a way we could say in the collective unconscious of our species and that's to say that we all potentially have it in in potential and um but i'm pointing out in my work you see as a westerner as a modern westerner i'm actually translating this indigenous term, which is completely mind-blowingly profound. It, it's, you know, it's like a higher dimensional idea. And I'm just translating it into a modern psychological idiom because it's, it's what's, it's what's at, it's what's at the bottom of the collective madness that's playing out in the world today. And, um, and it works through the, the blind spots of our psyche. It's a form of blindness, but it's a peculiar form of blindness that actually thinks it's sighted. And not only does it think it's sighted, it, it thinks it's more sighted than people who actually see. So in a way, because it operates through the projective tendencies of the mind, what it does, it entrances us via our own projections, you know, such that we become conditioned and we react to our projections in a way where we create in a, this cocoon around us, which suffocates us. So it's at the bottom of, um, I mean, it's the malady. It's like, I want to say, yeah, this is the diagnosis from what our species is suffering from that what Tico, it, it's the source of the, the, you know, the, all the myriad world crises that we're facing and the solution is to be found within what Tico because what Tico is to be found within the psyche, within us, but it has a magical, so yeah, I you know just to complete this um this very short encapsulation, it it has a magical way. It's an inner psycho spiritual disease of the soul that somehow is able to extend itself out into the world and configure events in the outer world so as to reflect back the state of a psyche under its thrall. Now, what I just described that's amazing because, in other words, when we begin to see the correlation between what's happening in the outer world and what's playing out within our mind, that's when we begin to see what he go. And that's also a description of a dream that when the outer environment that we're inhabiting is reflecting the inner state of ourselves. Well, that's a hundred percent description of what happens in a dream because a dream is just a reflection of your mind. So the thing about what Tico is that it's a quantum phenomena that it contains in a superposition of states the deepest pathology and encoded within it its own um, medicine, its own vaccine. It's actually helping us to wake up. It's this revelation. It's, it's actually revealing to us everything we need to know in order to wake up. But if we don't recognize what it's revealing to us, then it just assumed, assumes it's programmed, um, you know, it's program of killing us. And so what I'm pointing at and it can only operate and have power over us to the extent we don't see it. Because remember, it operates through the blind spots. That's why my whole work is trying to help people to see it. Because when you see it, you take away its power over you and you empower yourself. And, um, and when you see it, you see, it has no creative power at all, but it's a master impersonator. So it actually impersonates us. It offers us this fictitious identity, this limited identity. Oh, I'm wounded. I'm traumatized. I'm limited in a certain way. And now keep in mind, it has no power over us at all when we're in our true nature. So that's why it impersonates us. It offers us this fake identity. As soon as we identify with its version of ourselves, 
then it has us because then it can manipulate us, then it can control us. And if you think about what I've just described, there are three facets of that. One is we give ourselves away. Second, we identify with who we're not. And third is we, we disconnect from our intrinsic creative power. That's a recipe for madness. And that's what Tico. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what rises up in me as you say that. Jung's comment, the unconscious meets you on the outside, meaning you're unconscious of what you're creating. There's your blind spot until you identify with Tico within yourself through the indications that you're not expressing your authentic self. You're saying and doing things that might be classified as evil or hurtful or are actually uh, damaging to your own life and your own vitality and your own relationships. Yeah, well, exactly right. Like, you know, that young, because, you know, he says that again and again in different ways in his collected works, like the unconscious, it approaches us from outside of ourselves. And what, what he's talking about is that when we're unconscious of something, I mean, think about it in a dream. If you're unconscious of something, you project out that content. And then the dream being nothing other than a reflection of you, of your mind, the dream then has no choice but to embody the projected content. And all of a sudden now there it is outside of yourself. And if you're asleep in the dream and don't, don't recognize the process that you're participating in, i.e. that you're dreaming, you're then going to subjectively experience your own unconscious mind projected out in front of you in a very convincing way that it's other than yourself. And then you actually react to it or become conditioned by it and, you know, and that's, that's the, the psychological dynamic of what Tico, but yeah, exactly. Our unconscious is, is approaching us from outside of ourselves. That's why it's so important to have the recognition of, oh my God, what I'm seeing out there, what I'm irritated by or annoyed by or reacting against out there. It's actually this mirror reflecting back, you know, my own unconscious. And that's when we're beginning, when we begin to withdraw the projection and own our own stuff or our shadow or unconscious, whatever. And then we become more integrated, more whole. But to the extent we're not doing that, we're just going to continue to project out our own unconscious and, and then sort of do this like boxing, this shadow boxing, where we're really fighting against our own shadow. Or trying to inject it. <laughs> right. <laughs> trying, to va- like- trying to vaccinate with Tico. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally. My God, that's a huge topic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, I think that's the undercurrent of what we're trying to address in the world is that, of course, and everything associated with it, because that's just the surface of, you know, to use your term, Wetiko's show right now. Um, you used a word that I that I want to also address because it's a powerful word, but it's it's another one of those words that gets so confused and, and used so many ways. And and I'll preface it by saying we're, we're when we're talking about evil, the issue of evil is tricky because it's a relative term. You can't have good without evil. So, you know, what's for example, there's African tribes who remove the clitoris of girls and sometimes sew their labia together when they go through puberty. And and to many Westerners, that's evil. To do something like that to anybody's evil, but to them it's not evil at all. It's something they've been doing for thousands of years, and it's and they have their own reasons for it. So there you see, you can set up this huge polarity because you don't believe in somebody else's beliefs or cultures, or you know, a lot of Western people think circumcision is evil, and and you know, all you got to do is mention circumcision on the internet or on a Facebook forum and watch people go absolutely berserk. So, but to the Jewish people, that's cleanliness. It has nothing to do with evil. So I, I would just love to hear, what does it mean when you use terms like Wetiko can make us do evil or we have evil in us because Wetiko's in us? Yeah, no, sure. And I'm hyper aware that evil is one of those terms that's such a charged term and people have so many associations to the word. And now keep in mind, I'm not, um, coming from the place of being a scholar or an academic or a theoretical philosopher, 
I'm coming from my own experience, and I had this overwhelming encounter, this direct encounter with what I call archetypal evil, not just personal evil, but archetypal evil, the stuff, the evil that's in myths and fairy tales the world over. And um, it, it totally destroyed my entire family. It almost killed me. And yet it was this initiatory ordeal that I was able to go through and to discover myself and discover my work. I never would have been able to articulate my work without that experience. And so, you know, that being said, it's a, I feel it's incredibly important to be able to talk about evil. And um, so many people, as soon as you use that word, they just get triggered and it has all these like um, the, the religious connotations. And, and I understand that. And I'm not talking as a, um, this metaphysician or as a theology person. I'm more talking from the point of view of just a, of a student of the psyche. And psychologically, as Jung says, evil is incredibly real. And evil has become a great power that's driving the world stage. And he actually is pointing at that encoded in evil that there actually might be some form of profound teaching or blessing or a gift that we need to, you know, understand. And, and I, I totally feel that. And so I think, you know, because one of the things about evil, it actually dumbs us down because, oh, it's so hard to talk about it. And then here it's in our midst and we're acting it out all over the place, including within our own mind. And, um, but nobody's allowed to talk about it. That's insanity. So I'm trying to bring an intelligent discussion and trying, you know, really to just shed light on what is the nature of this, this thing we call evil. And just one final thing. I mean, I think about, you know, more and more my mind gets blown as I come ac across different traditions and teachers that are pointing at Watiko in their own way. That's one of the things my new book is about. And one of the people, there's a great teacher, Rudolf Steiner, the anthroposophist. And Steiner, he would he was pointing out that the greatest event of our time is the incarnation of the etheric Christ. And so he's saying Christ, you know, the self, you could think of it symbolic symbolic of that, that was not incarnating just through one man, but was incarnating through the collective consciousness of our species. But then what Steiner said was very interesting. He says, before we can actualize this incarnation, of the etheric Christ, we are fated to encounter the beast. In other words, radical evil. And, and what I'm pointing at is that, yeah, that's initiatory and that's a way of understanding what Tico, and it's a way of understanding what we're dealing with in the world today. Hello, everybody. If exercise is something important to you that you are sure not to miss a day of, it's important to remember that you don't get stronger in the gym, you get stronger when you rest. If you have a hard time committing yourself to exercising enough to keep yourself fit and healthy, then learning how to do it quickly and effectively is where the magic is. There's a fine line between being in the gym and overtraining and not doing enough to keep yourself fit, but there's always a sweet spot that brings you into balance, contributing to harmony in your life. If your goal is to be your fittest while being highly efficient with your time so you can engage other important aspects of your life and produce well-being, then I've written an ebook just for you, Paul Check's Big Bang Workouts. In the book, I will teach you my Big Bang approach to fitness. You will learn what makes something a Big Bang exercise so you can identify them or even create them for yourself, how to perform some of my simple but powerful Big Bang exercises. I offer three specific Big Bang workouts, simple program design techniques you can create your own Big Bang workouts with, two important rules for maximizing your workout results that apply to everyone from novice exercises to the world's best professional athletes. If you put all the information I share in Paul Check's Big Bang workouts to work in your life, you will get fitter, you'll have more energy, and you'll have more time to work in, do some art, and spend time with your loved ones. All the things that make a complete, healthy, happy human being. Get your copy of the ebook for free now at chekinstitute.com forward slash big bang. That's chekinstitute.com forward slash big bang.
Enjoy Paul Check's Big Bang Workouts. You'll never feel better. Now, just to take that a little bit further, uh, just because I feel it's important. When people ask me what I mean when I say evil, I say any act that is immoral, and I distinguish a moral as a code of conduct that is life affirmative. So acts of evil are actually destructive. If we, if we are cutting down so many trees and poisoning the soils, and we're cutting off our own connection to the great chain of being, which is inevitably going to lead to a massive disaster, to me, that's an act of evil or to uh, hurt someone or beat them up because they have a different belief system than you do would, in my lexicon, would be an act of evil. Um, you know, we all want to live and acts of evil. And, and, and as you know, if you look at the word live and read it backwards, it says E-V-I-L. So I tell people evil is living backwards. In other words, living in ways that do not enhance your connection to your soul, to spirit to relationships, to the reality that we are dreaming up together, but we must maintain together, such as nature. Um, how do those concepts work with regard to how you would say evil, evil is expressed via Wetiko? Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, so, so here's, it, it brings up a lot what you just shared, Paul, because Wetiko is what's called this daimonic energy. And, and a daimon is the inner voice or the guiding spirit. And when something's this daimonic energy, it can literally take over and, and possess a person or a group of people, you know, or a species. And so this inner guide, the, you know, you can call it the genius, the daimon, the muse, the angel, the ally. It has infinite names, which is expressing that it has a miracle like nature. And when we get into sort of into relationship with this daimon, it becomes the inner guide and it helps us to awaken and it helps us to find our calling and it connects us with our inner voice and it connects us with, with our vocation, with what we're here to do. But if we turn away from that daimon and, and avoid it, that daimon consolates negatively, it becomes a demon. So the point is there's a really strong, there's like a, a superposition of states between the creative and the destructive. They're side by side. And so what I'm, and encoded in that daimon is the creative spirit, you know? And so the point is, is that encoded in what the Native American people call Watiko is the creative spirit. And if we, and that's why the medicine for Watiko again and again, I point this out in so many different ways, is to connect with our creative spirit but to the extent we don't do that that same energy that would be informing the creative spirit consolates negatively and becomes a demon becomes destructive and then either self or other destructive we either you know slowly are killing ourselves or we're enacting you know this destructive process in the world and when you know eight billion people are doing that like you see today, you know, not all 8 billion, but, but millions of people, maybe billions, you know, we're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the planet. So in a sense, we are enacting a collective form of suicide. And that's totally in alignment with, yeah, we're having a collective psychosis, which is what Watiko is. And for me, it's just insane that it's not headline news, you know, all over the world that, oh, you know, we as a species are having a psychic epidemic, that that's the real pandemic that's happening as far as, you know, the real deadly pandemic and the origin of it is in our own psyche and it can totally destroy us. But if we, in that energy is our genius, is our creative spirit. That's what I continually am trying to point at. I agree a hundred percent. And what came up with in me as you were talking that I'd like to just share briefly and, 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 and just dialogue with you on is, you know, when you look at the creation of the universe, we know, for example, that stars explode and depending on whose physics you are aligned with, it creates a black hole and then it draws things into it 
and then it compresses them down and it gives birth to a new star through a white hole. Um, you know, we, 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 if we, you know, there's an old saying, if you want to make an omelet, you got to crack some eggs, right? So the point that I'm making is the creative impulse has this destructive impulse because to make something out of something else, you have to transform it. You got to cut trees down to build a house. You got to clear land and push the deer and the squirrels out to, to uh, build a soccer field or a football field. So I think that the parallel between the creative and the destructive is so tight because you're taking matter, let's say, or living matter, and you are, you know, cracking the egg. You're, there's no more chicken coming out of that egg. You just wipe the chicken out. You're going to eat the egg. But nature seems to have those creative forces in balance. But when Watiko starts getting into us, it seems like we lose the balance between the destruction for creation. Steiner said it's okay to cut down trees as long as you're going to do something better with them. And the example he was giving, like if you're cutting trees down to build a school for children, that's an effective use of destructive or creative energy. But if you're cutting uh, trees down to build another shopping mall and you've already got 20 of them in town or a pay parking lot, then that's bordering on destruction in a negative perspective. So what I'm trying to ask for is, do you feel that, that, that the creative destructive impulse of the universe that sits like yin and yang in a circle is actually the nature of our creative ability, but the evil is when we lose the balance of how to use the destruction for creation and it just becomes destruction. Yeah. No, I, I, I just so appreciate what you're saying because what Watiko does, it, it, it is sort of, um, you know, the inspiration for us getting one sided and out of balance. And one way of understanding, um, or, or of answering your question is the thing about Watiko, um, you know, it's this dreamed up phenomena. And so in other words, seeing this, this universe as a dream that we're all collectively each moment we're dreaming up, we are dreaming up this collective madness. Now in a dream, when we get one-sided, when we get off balance, well, what happens? The unconscious compensates our one-sidedness. And we then all of a sudden through dreams, through symbols, you know, it will help us to get in balance if we get in resonance and recognize what is symbolically being revealed. And so it's the same thing. When I say that Watiko is this like living revelation, it's the same idea that what's playing out in the world through the madness and through, you know, the evil of, of Watiko is actually symbolically revealing to us our out of balanceness or our, our one sidedness. And similar to a symbol in dream, if we get, if we recognize what it's showing us, then all of a sudden, you know, it transduces psychic energy. We all of a sudden access something in us that we weren't in touch with and you know uh, we get more creative we get more you know in balance and so absolutely there has to be a balance and and watiko not only is the inspiration for that out of balance but then it feeds off of it as, as long as we then are out of balance that becomes fuel for watiko because if you you know one thing about watiko it, i mean there are so many aspects of it that are just mind-blowing it feeds off of polarization. It feeds off of fear. As soon as we see, in essence, what Watiko is, is it's this misidentification of who we think we are. Before I found the name, I was calling it malignant egophrenia, M-E disease, me disease. It's a misidentification of who we think we are. When we identify, remember I said Watiko presents us, presents us with a fictitious identity. When we identify as, you could say, a skin encapsulated ego, this reference point in third dimensional space and time, we're not that. No, but as soon as, law, as, soon as we identify with that limited version, then we've misidentified with who we are. 
we think we're, we identify with a separate self. We think, I think I'm separate from you. And what Tico, as soon as there's a separate self, there is an other. As soon as there is other, there's fear. As soon as there's fear, that's the superfood for Watiko. And then it just will inspire the most incredible polarization. And, you know, the thing that I'm pointing out is like not only the creative, you know, process is, you know, connecting with that in yourself is the medicine, but also remembering who we are, that we don't exist as a separate self, that that's an illusion, that we actually are interdependent and interconnected with each other and with the whole universe that's to step out of, of the imagination of existing in a way that we don't. And that's to, to remember who we are. And the expression of that is, is love, is compassion. We, we, you know, we can realize, oh, yeah, we're all on the same side. We're not separate. If I help you, it helps me because ultimately we're not separate. And that's then we're, we're oriented in the right direction. And then we're, t- we're plugging into the medicine for the Watiko mind virus. But the thing which is the most interesting thing about all of this is that it was the Watiko mind virus that inspired us to have that realization. So is Watiko evil or is it the highest blessing? That's the question. Yeah. Or, or, you know, what it reminds me of is, you know, the Zen master walking around the room with his bow. And if you're falling asleep, he whacks you to bring you back into a state of conscious awareness so that you're not just unconscious. It's like when people use plant medicines, I, I, I say, well, especially when I'm talking to, you know, shaman and people that lead journeys, I say, one of the things you got to be very careful with leading a plant medicine ceremony is if you overdose the person to the point that they go unconscious, they don't learn anything. So now you're just wasting plant medicines. And so I think part of the problem is that we've collectively fallen into the state of unconscious. And we're like a bunch of people that are just drugged out of our minds, running around destroying everything. And we need a whack from the weak, the Zen master, and 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 we're bringing this on ourselves. But we, we, if we don't wake up pretty soon, obviously we're going to, you know, bring us into a state of terminal. Uh, well, you know, yeah. But we're going to reach a tipping point from which there's just no return. Right. Right. And so. Many psychologists, if you search the internet for opinions on, 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 from psychologists as to the psychological state of many of our world leaders that are behind what's going on, you'll see over and over again that they, they repeatedly say we have psychopathic leaders. We have people that are, uh, you know, they're acting in ways and behaving in ways and doing things to people that are clearly classically psychopathic behavior, like a serial killer or somebody like that. And when I, when I look at what evil is, there's three things that are very prevalent. One is the constant need to consume, right? Like how, how, when does, when does Bill Gates own enough would be a question. When do when does George Soros reach the point of satiation with how many people's lives he can completely fuck up? Um, and then there's power. There, there seems when evil is around, there seems to be this insatiable appetite for power and control is the third one. So consumption, power, and control. And so it seems like. These people that are the world leaders behind the Great Reset, the Trilateral Commission, they all have this appetite for power, consumption, and control, even when it's just destroying everything around them. But Lao Tzu warned, or he, he didn't warn, he said, the government always reflects the people, which goes right back to your statement that we're having a collective Wetiko event. But these are the people that seem to be sort of like the envelopment of our shadow in full force. I'd just love to, to hear your thoughts on that perspective. Yeah. Oh, I'm right with you. I mean, because I, I freak out when I see, oh my God, you know, whether it's Bill Gates or whoever, the powers that be or whoever's controlling him. And keep in mind, he himself and other people, they're just pawns in the hand of the deeper archetype. They're just, you know, they're just, as, you know, even more victimized by the formless archetype than any of us, you know, ultimately speaking, but it's all about centralizing power and control. And, and that's, that's a sickness that's, you know, 
I mean, that opens the door for evil. But I even take it the next step, you know, in my contemplation. And I wonder, well, how come that's happening? Like, what is that? What is that teaching us? What is that showing us? And I go back to this being a dream. And if I'm in a dream, right, say if I'm in a dream at night and I'm, I'm in a sleeping dream, and say if I'm not in touch with my creative agency and my creative power, right? So what happens? Like you said, quoting Jung, the unconscious always approaches us from outside. So then if I'm unconscious of my own creative power, well, what's going to happen? It gets projected out and dreamed up through the forms of the dream and into the, into the night dream will walk a person or a group of people or the state or whoever, which will be more than happy to, you know, to implement my own intrinsic creative power against me because I've disowned it. I've disconnected from it. I've projected it out. And so what I'm saying, when you see this as the dream, the, the, our waking life as the dream and you interpret it as such and you like wonder what is it revealing to us? It couldn't be more in our face, so to speak, that, oh my God, it's revealing to us that I, each one of us individually and collectively as a species, we're not in touch with our creative agency. So of course it makes perfect sense that we're going to dream up external powers that be to, to use our own creative power against us. And that's actually what's happening, but that's showing us something because the point is each one of us have immense, unimaginable creative power at our disposal. We always have 24 seven. We've been using our creativity, but to the extent we're unconscious of it, we use it against ourselves in a way where we're literally hypnotizing ourselves and killing ourselves. And what I'm pointing at, and quantum physics was, you know, I wrote a book on quantum physics because it's providing us with the medicine for Watiko. It's literally showing us that, you know, that our act of observing this universe moment by moment, how we interpret our experience, the meaning we place on our experience, that it's creative, that we have this unbelievable creative power. But to the extent we don't know we have it, like I've been saying, then it turns against us and it kills us. So what I'm pointing at is that when you see exactly what you were describing, Paul, around, you know, the, the, the psychopaths in power and how, you know, the, the totalitarianism that's happening and it's centralizing power and control, control and taking away our freedoms and separating us from each other. Yeah. What is that an expression of? What is that showing us? It's literally showing us that, you know, we're disconnected from that creative agency. And, and that's good news in the sense that then at least we know where the solution is to be found, i.e. that we can actually remember our nature because our nature is creative. When you have the realization of your nature, of the true nature, you realize, oh, my true nature is creative by its very nature. When you realize that, you then not only express yourselves creatively, you become creative each and every moment. And the more you become creative, the more you know your nature. It becomes a positive feedback loop that creates light upon light. That, right, what I just described, not just for one person, that will improve their life. But when you have sufficient number of people who are having that realization, and embodying that creative spirit and connecting with each other. And then what I call, they can conspire to co-inspire each other. That's a real conspiracy theory. They can, they, there's this collective genius. They can activate the collective genius in the field and they can literally dream ourselves awake. What I'm pointing at, that's to actually realize we are being invited to participate consciously in our own evolution. That's what all of this is about. That's what's happening in the world. That's what it's reflecting to us. But if we don't recognize that, then we're just going to continue to destroy ourselves. I, I think what you just said is just absolutely freaking beautiful. P3OM by Bioptimizers is hands down one of the most important supplements to have on you everywhere you go. If you're traveling, if you go to work, if you're going to friend's house to eat, this product will knock out food poisoning and almost any kind of gut disorder from viruses, bacteria, fungi, whatever could irritate your gut so quickly. It's mind-blowing. I have been using this product since Wade Lightheart first turned me on to it, and he's the formulator of it. 
And I've got Wade here to tell us how it works, but I just want you to hear it from me. I have all my clients use this. I try to get it to friends, to family members, because it is really like your own bodyguard. So Wade, how in the world does this thing work so well every time? Well, as you know, we're very research oriented and we have literally a university in Croatia that we do microbiome testing with our labs of PhDs to find out what's the most effective formulation. And we are quickly moving into the post-antibiotic world where we need to cultivate super probiotics. We all heard of super bad bacteria in hospitals and stuff that are antibiotic resistance. But what we did, we worked with a medical doctor that was able to take an aggressive strain of L. plantarum, which is a very aggressive strain, and then put it through almost like a BUDS camp, a Navy SEALs training where we subjected this particular probiotic to a toxic environment. We ran a sine wave through it. And out of that survived only about somewhere between two and 3%. We then take that and grow it on very special food. We feed them just like you would feed a great athlete. You feed them special food and the probiotics develop unique capabilities. We have a US patent that is so powerful. I can't read it on the airwaves because we'd get canceled. But what I can say is when you put P3OM in your body, it goes out and breaks down any undigested protein, whether it's in your gut or through your blood system. And it becomes your Navy SEALs defense force, if you will, to go out and wipe out whatever pathogen might come in your body. You just need more of these guys to overwhelm it. It takes it out. It cleans up any messes. And for the last 18 years, I've been using P3OM daily. And I can honestly say, I've never been sick during that time. If I feel something coming on, I just double down my dosage, take four caps every night. If I get a little, if I'm traveling, I take twice that. And it's been great. A lot of our people do it. And it's one of our best selling products. And it's available to your audience. Just go to p3om.com slash living40. Put in Paul 10, get a 10% discount. And if it's not the best probiotic you've ever had in your life, you get 100% of your money back. That's from us at Bioptimizers. That's our guarantee for you. Go get it. It's for real. I love the stuff. Thank you, Wade. There's two factors I want to share with you and the listeners. One of them's very rooted in a lot of people's philosophical orientation, which I think is dangerous, which I'll bring up in a second. But the other factor is, you know, if you look at how much destruction happens when we release responsibility to the state to do whatever it wants with billions and trillions of tax dollars. We get what we have in the world because we're not taking responsibility with what's happening with our energy as money. We're just giving money to some fictitious or illusory or uh, whatever you want to call it, the, the White House or the state. And the next thing you know, they're starting wars and blowing shit up and and picking on people and and everyone's saying, oh my God, Saddam Hussein this, and we're getting all sorts of propaganda. But a lot of that comes back to our childlike trust in an entity that's using our power, but we're not taking responsibility for the creative agency of the energy we're giving away. So we're really investing unconsciously in what would be like a business that's destructive. Now, why I'm bringing that up is because, as you know, the more stressed people get, the more left brain they get, and the less access to their creative potential they have. And then there seems to be from people like many of the interviews with people, um, Viktor Frankl, for example, When people were dying in Hitler's gas chambers and concentration camps, they all of a sudden started having these powerful visions and almost like shamanic awakenings. And the ones that got out of there became very powerful people because they had to confront Watiko kind of like you did in your experience, but it activated their creative potential. The point I'm bringing up is if we don't start paying attention to what Watiko is and we don't take time to center ourselves, meditate, breathe, eat real food, slow down, and hold hands and say, what do we want to create right now? Each step we go with with more mandates and more control and more rioting and more destruction, 
as a therapist, I see we're running the risk of getting to the point where we're so scared we're feeding with Tico, but we're not accessing our creative potential because we waited too long. Do you yeah. agree yeah. with that? Totally. Oh, absolutely. No. I mean, we're getting to a place where, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to become too late unless we wake up. I mean, it's really, it's a very urgent time. It's an amazing time in history. And, you know, what Tico in the Castaneda books, Castaneda, you know, Castaneda's teacher, Don Juan, what didn't know the name or wasn't using the name Watiko, but he called it the topic of topics, you know, and I point out it's the most important thing to understand in the world today, bar none. And anybody, you know, and it's just like, because if we don't come to terms with Watiko, by whatever name we call it, you know, in the apocryphal text, it's called the counterfeiting spirit, you know, and in, in my new book, I go through all these different traditions or Philip K. Dick, for example, called it the Black Iron Prison. And, you know, I have a whole chapter on that, and it's completely, precisely maps on to the indigenous description of what Tico, what Philip K. Dick is saying, what the counterfeiting spirit is, you know, have that, that description. And it's so interesting, the very thing all of these visionary artists and philosophers and thinkers and spiritual traditions are pointing at is the very thing that our species is blind to. And I guess that's why they're pointing at it. And so I guess my point is that, yeah, I'm in agreement with you that, um, you know, there's nothing more important in the world at all to understand because whether you talk about with the threat of, you know, with nuclear war or climate change or any of the, the economic, you know, crimes that are happening, the transfer of wealth, the, uh, political malfeasance, the, it's all informed by the Watiko mind virus. And this is something that's found in the psyche, in each one of us. And we think part of the programming is for us to believe, oh, I'm so helpless. And what's happening is so overwhelming. But I'm pointing out that each one of us have this unimaginably vast creative power and any one of us having the realization of our nature, of who we actually are, and connecting with our creative spirit. Like this beautiful example in the collected works, Jung talks about the image of when you have a glass of water and you dissolve sugar, little grains of sugar in the water, they'll just dissolve and dissolve. And then it reaches the saturation point and you add one more grain of sugar and a crystal manifests. And he compares that to the way a symbol actually will emerge out of the unconscious. And also any one of us having the realization of our nature, connecting with our creative spirit, seeing our shadow, recognizing what Tico, whatever you would call it, awakening to the dreamlike nature, any one of us could be that grain of sugar that catalyzes an awakening in the collective consciousness of our species. And that's very, very hopeful. And quantum physics says the same thing. Quantum physics is pointing at, I mean, in essence, that any, you know, each and every moment, there's this incredible potentiality before you observe the quantum entity, how it's going to manifest. And even, and then you observe it, you dream it up in whatever way, and it'll actualize in one particular way as that moment, and all the other potentialities vaporize as if they never existed into a parallel universe. And what quantum physics is pointing out is that even if one of those potentials is, is highly, ridiculously unlikely, uh, unlikely, it could still be the way this next moment manifests. And so, for example, the fact that, that, that humanity could potentially wake up this moment and avert the incredible myriad catastrophes that we are literally creating, quantum physics is saying, oh, that's a very real possibility. And I would point out, well, if we're not thinking of in that way, then what are we thinking? Then if we're just identified and caught by the pessimistic, despairing, depressed attitude of feeling helpless and hopeless and thinking we're doomed, then we're unwittingly being a vector for Watiko. Well, you just set up the next point that I wanted to bring up more perfectly than it could be set up. And that's this. And I know you're aware of what I'm about to share, and that's why I want to address it. There are many philosophers, 
existentialists and people and even quantum physicists and physicists. I've heard many physicists say this. In fact, what's his name? The guy that wrote, uh, uh, it'll come back to me, but I recently watched an interview with him. He's one of the, he's the kind of the pine, the real big name behind the multi-worlds philosophy, wrote a whole book on it. Um, physicist, but anyhow, the point that I'm getting at is many people are of this belief that we are insignificant when they say, oh, look at the size of the universe, a human being's insignificant. And I read the meditations by Marcus Aurelius and overall it was a great book, but he too said, any human being is insignificant in the grand whole. So don't fall in love with yourself kind of concept. Now, a lot of people in the crisis that we're in kind of cave in like a turtle pulling itself inside of its shell or an ostrich burying its head in the sand and hope it'll all blow away. And, and, and many in my family are, are like that. I've had some interesting discussions and like, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't care what the science is. I'm just doing what I got to do so I can keep my job. And I'm like, yeah, but you're, you're falling right into the trap and you're believing that you're insignificant. And so how I approach this with my students is this. I say, first of all, part of the problem people have is that they have a very narrow, limited conception of the power of God or source. If you want to use a non-God word, just source, whatever's creating everything we call the universe or the multiverse or the omniverse. So here's the example I give. I say, okay, let's do a ex thought experiment. I'm going to take a balloon. And I'm going to blow that balloon up till it's absolutely full. And that represents the infinite power of God invested in every point in space time, regardless of where you're at, even in your dream. And I see now, if I had a balloon with infinite power and you took one needle and said, this is my self, and you poke that balloon, what would happen? Well, you would have a big bang of a size that would make a new universe but it only took one person to poke that balloon. So the, the, the thing I want to get your opinion on is that we have all these people out there that feel so insignificant and so unpowerful that they're just laying over and playing dead and hoping this is all going to disappear while they're lining up to, to get their jabs and, and conform, thinking that's how you make it go away. But I'm saying, wait a minute, you've been reading the wrong books or going to the wrong churches when you realize that it took the entire universe to create every one of us, every single one of us is a product of the entire universe, every soul is, then you are the needle that has the power of the whole that's in the imaginary balloon. And like you said, any one of us can put that last grain of sugar in or, or be the one that brings the consciousness to the surface that shifts us. I mean, People talk about Jesus all the time. They talk about Buddha all the time, but they were one individual that created an entire philosophy that changed the world. But people that keep waiting for somebody else to come do that. I say it's time for all of us to get still and sit under a tall tree and access the truth of ourselves and get clear what is it that we're creating in the world? Because if we each take responsibility for our creative power and our creative ability and our creative license, with the intention of saying, what can I do to contribute to the awakening of humanity so that we can all realize that we have the power to create something beautiful right now instead of dying together out of ignorance through an unconscious event, then we need to do that. So the real point I'm bringing up to synthesize that is where do you stand with this? We're insignificant. We're just a drop in a universe versus we're powerful and we can make changes even one of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and I feel, I mean, it's a quantum, you know, it's it, the predicament is very quantum. And what I mean is that, yeah, from one reference point, we're incredibly insignificant. From another reference point, you know, um, we are the, the vessels through which God is incarnating, you know, and that gives us, we're playing a crucial role in the incarnation of the deity. And what you said was so cool, it brought up so many things for me, because it's like, if you have a crystal, I think um, I read somewhere that if you want to crack open a crystal, you know, or a big geode or something, and if you just keep on hitting it, it you know, it won't crack it open. But if you find that there's a particular like 
whatever you call it, like weak point. Yeah, the weak point, the leverage point, the juncture, and you just hit it right there. The whole crystal opens up. And, and it brings to mind, um, you know, in one of my books, I talk about, say, if you're typing on your computer and your hands are one key to the right and you're typing and it looks like a complete mess and, you know, on the screen and you think, oh my God, it's going to take so much work to fix everything. Where do I even begin? But then when you inquire into it, the solution is just, oh, just move your fingers a quarter of an inch to the left and <laughs> yeah. everything is is back and is fine and is perfect and is optimal. <laughs> it's like that. And the thing which is interesting about the work I'm doing, because I'm just following my process and just offering myself, you know, as an instrument, you know, when all of it resulted from my encounter with Watika, with evil, and what I'm basically, more and more what I feel, you see, the thing about, about Watika you know, one meme you could say in terms of it's this it's this magical idea whose time has come. When people get turned on to the idea of Watiko and really get switched on, like even Jung himself said, in times of collective psychosis, only one thing can save us. And that one thing is a new symbolic idea. And that's exactly what Watiko is. It's a saving idea. And when you really take it online into your minds and understand what it's pointing at and what it's a revelation of, your consciousness expands and you become transformed. And so what I've been more and more tripping out on is, oh my God, by me just being this instrument for um, this work, you know, for writing my books and, you know, offering it to the world and people that are really getting, you know, benefit and it's medicine in a certain way, it's like, I've, in a sense, injected this thought form in, into, you know, into the dream. And it's bypassing the military industrial complexes like radar or censorship or whatever. And, you know, when enough people really get switched on to what Watiko is a revelation of and what it's pointing at and what it can activate in themselves that it's showing us the dreamlike nature, that realization, just like a virus can go viral, that realization becomes contagious and can go viral. And it can, in a literal, real way, change the collective dream we're having. And, and, all, and the only way I've, I've like found myself in that role is just by somehow trusting my own guidance and, and just um, following my own process and the thing which is so amazing to me is why am I doing that? It was because of Watiko. It was because I had the direct encounter with Watiko and it could have killed me. It could have made me completely insane. It could have split me off and I would have just become disabled. And of course, psychiatry, from their point of view, they would have considered that a successful treatment because from their point of view, when I was having my awakening and then I immediately got thrown into the, into the psychiatric system. They were telling me, oh, you have a mental illness. We guarantee it. You're going to have to be on drugs the rest of your life. And then when I refused to take on board, you know, their diagnosis, that just confirmed to them my illness. And oh, now he's in denial of his illness. And if I would have subscribed to their version of what was happening to me, it would have killed me. And they would have been like, great, another successful treatment. What's wrong? With <laughs> yeah. What's wrong with that picture? You know, it's insane. And it so sounds dangerously. Yeah. It sounds all too dangerously familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was enacting like this, you know, in my individual person, this like macrocosmic collective process. And I was lucky enough to be able to come through it and, and out of that to bring some sort of gift that, that emerged out of that process that I wouldn't have in any way been able to access without having gone through that. So, you know, I'm really fortunate in that way. Well, a couple of things come up listening to you, and I'm very grateful for everything you're saying because it's it's so, you know, it's heart centered for me. It, it's it's, you know, truth. When you hear truth, it brings your body and your mind and your heart into alignment. And and I don't know about the listeners, but when I read your books and when I listen to your to your words, I I feel that I'm hearing truth. I'm like Jung listening to Philemon, you know? And Rumi says in his many places, 
in his teachings, and I have his collective work, so I've studied it quite a bit. But Rumi says, in paraphrase, that the reason our hearts get broken is so the love can flow out. And, you know, in many ways, uh, billions of people are getting their hearts broken right now. But the question is, when are we going to realize that this is the opportunity to, to take that love that's flowing out and put it to work constructively? And I'll, I'll give you an example. When patients come to me with their bodies all screwed up and diseases and, you know, they're just like at their wits end. They've been in the medical system for years. They're broke because they've had so many surgeries and they're down at the bottom of the barrel. And I say, look, there's something important to realize. You can either blame this on a virus or you can blame it on a, a cancer cell and make cancer the enemy, like the war on cancer or the war on diabetes or whatever. Or you can realize that you now have objective means of measuring how powerful you are as a creator. And all you've got to do is use the same power to create what you want instead of what you don't want. And it seems to me that when we look into the world and see how much power we're using collectively to destroy life and destroy our bonds with each other and destroy our potential to create harmony together, that if we just say, okay, it's time for us to use that power to create harmony and to bring ourselves back into a one world family and get past racism and vax versus unvaxed or any of these. Uh, dualities and and really just look at the power we're using and say let's just flip the polarity and get clear on what we all want to have and what we need and what the planet needs it, it it just seems it's just a matter of awakening to the fact that we've got to get rid of some bad habits and become conscious of what it is that has that has to be created collectively because none of us is powerful enough to create something that big by ourselves. So we've got to do it together. I think that's one of the beautiful things. We're at a point right now where if we don't work together, we can't get past this obstacle. Somehow we've got to harmonize together. Yeah, no, you're absolutely you know, right on. I mean, when you think about what we're doing, we're investing our creative intelligence and genius into creating ever more destructive with these weapons of mass destruction. I mean, and just think about that for a moment. That's how we're investing our genius. And it's insane, you know? And, but I'm pointing at, you know, from my work, if this is a dream, and if that's a dream, that's a dreaming process, what is that reflecting back? Well, that's reflecting back that our creative spirit, instead of being channeled in a constructive way, where we can actually, you know, co-inspire each other and, and actually we can help each other to wake up. I mean, you know, in, in Buddhism, they talk about the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, the, the gem, the, the triple jewel, the teacher, the teaching of the community. And there are some teachers who were saying the most important of the jewel modern day is the Sangha, is community, is for us to like, you know, snap out of the illusion that we exist as a separate self to recognize that I, de for my, my, you know, survival, I depend on you. We depend on each other and, you know, and then to get in sync with each other and to invest our genius in a way of actually like healing ourselves. Like what a radical idea. But what a concept. What, right. What a concept. Right. Exactly. But that's what's being reflected to us. That's what's being demanded of us or, or else, or we're just fated you know, to continue to destroy each other. And what it also brings up in me, I mean, it's so trippy because sometimes I'll have a feeling, oh my God, you know, it's like if you have a dream at night and if you don't get the message, what happens? It recurs. You, you re-dream it. Dream. And then, <laughs> yeah. but it gets more and more amplified and more and more intense until you finally get the message. So I've been been tripping out over, oh my God, it's like this is a recurring dream. And we as uh, as beings as have been here trillions of times before. And then we've just blown ourselves up. And then in, in, in the, in, you know, being a dream in dream time, which, you know, where billions of years is just a flat, you know, blink of an eye, we then get back to the same scenario and we blow ourselves up again. And then it happens again and again and again. But maybe this time is the time in our evolution of us as a species that we recognize 
what we're actually unconsciously doing, that we're unconsciously killing ourselves, that we've gone out of our minds, and that it's completely available for us to wake up. There's nothing in our way that's stopping us from waking up. We already have the solution. I mean, that's one of, you know, if there's a message that I have for people, it's like, yeah, we already possess the medicine. We already possess the solution. We are that, you know, and, but it, it's like what I've been saying 24 seven, we are these creative beings made in the image of our creator. And, but to the, to the extent that we're not awake to that, then that gets turned against us. And so my prayer is that, you know, in my work, hopefully is to just share out of whatever little, whatever understanding I'm having that might really speak to other people's unconscious and activate their genius and, and help them to awaken to the dreamlike nature. And just like when you're in a dream at night and you as a character in the dream, the dream ego have lucidity and you recognize, oh my God, this isn't who I am. This is just a model for who I am. Who I am is the dreamer of the dream. And that, that deeper dreaming self is what I call it. That's dreaming the whole dream. And that, you know, think of it like a meditating Buddha having a dream. And you're just like the, the imagination or the dream of the meditating Buddha, but that's your true nature. When one figure in that night dream has that realization, that's one thing. And they have lucidity. That's one thing. But then imagine, just invoke your creative imagination. And when more and more of the dream characters in that dream, when they also have lucidity, and then they hang out and connect and trip out on what they're realizing. Oh my God, this dream universe we're in is manifesting the way it is in such a limited, problematic way because we, we've we been conditioned to dream it in a limited way. We can actually get in phase with each other and dream it in a way that's reflecting who we're discovering ourselves to be. You know, that's that's actually what we're being invited to step into that dream. What I just described is a night dream, but that's the nature of our situation in our waking dream. Exactly. And, you know, what, what rises up in me as you're speaking is, you know, many people will interpret this through their own filters, but I think you'll know what I'm saying. I think what we have an opportunity to do is ultimately usher in the second coming of Christ, but it's going to take us to dream together. And I'm not talking about a man. I'm talking about the Christ consciousness that we all are. And, you know, once we, once we look at the sugar or look at the water and say, okay, let's create harmony together. Let's create sustainability. Let's think of our children's future. When we start pouring love into the cup at the moment that the sugar appears, if we are in that Christ-like state of consciousness, then the sugar can only manifest the Christ itself, which will be the embodiment of what we create together. Uh, that, that, to me, that's, that's the real second coming of Christ. Waiting around for, you know, waiting around for some dude to come rescue us is really nothing different than taking a shot or a pill to make your problems go away. Yeah, no, that's exactly, you're right on. Like, you know, what, what I was talking about before with like the incarnation of the etheric Christ of, of Rudolf Steiner, it's exactly that. That is the second coming. And that's not coming through a physical individual guy. No, you know, that's actually, it's incarnating through the collective unconscious of our species. And it's also having to do with you know, in one of my next books, I forget which one, there's this great philosopher, um, Nicholas Berdy, uh, Berdyev, however you say his name, um, something like that. And he actually correlates being truly creative with the second coming. And he actually says, oh, if people are just passively waiting for the second coming, no, they're going to just, you know, they're going to die crucified on the cross, on the cross, still waiting. But as we step into our creative spirit, which is who we are, we are then offering ourselves as a vessel for the second coming. In other words, he's correlating the us connecting with our creative spirit with the incarnation of God through us via that act of being creative. And that is the, is the second coming, according to him. And so... The idea, it brings me back again to the profound importance of being creative. And I, when I say creative, I don't mean necessarily painting or doing drawing or sculpture. 
I mean, yeah, that's wonderful, but that's like a flatland version of being creative. I'm talking about that every moment of our lives is creative. We are literally creating our experience of ourselves and our experience of the world each and every moment. And, you know, to have that realization, it's a great responsibility, but it's so freeing because then we're, we're snapped out of being a victim. There's no one else doing anything to us, you know, and that's when we really connect with our true agency and power. And once we do that, that's when we can change the dream, the dream being the waking dream. Yes, I, I, I totally agree. And I, I just love it. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show. And I've got something great to share with you. I think you've all heard plenty in the news about zinc. But what you haven't heard about is Symbiotica's amazing new zinc complex, which is all organic and a unique formulation. And so because Shervin's the expert and the formulator and the founder of Symbiotica, I brought him in to tell us about the zinc complex and when we know we should use it because of the symptoms we're having. So, Shervin, how do we know we need this complex? You know, zinc, I'm a mineral guy. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> it's Thank like, God. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I mean, minerals are the root foundation of thought, emotion, and we're actually being present in the physical body. Without minerals, nothing can happen. Vitamins can't operate. Functions in the body can't happen. Hormones can't be made. You know, minerals are everything. And zinc in particular is very unique. I mean, think about it. They dip steel in zinc to keep it from corroding and rusting. That's called yeah. galvanization, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so just think about what it's doing in the body. Zinc acts as a super antioxidant in the body from top to bottom. Yeah. If you're deficient in zinc, most likely you have low libido, mm -hmm. low energy, depression. You're not motivated. You might have flaky skin. Mm. You're probably not sleeping well. You're probably not metabolizing well. Zinc is so profound in the human body that it crosses almost every barrier in the body. What do I mean by that? It's in your saliva. Yeah. It's in your snot. Mm -hmm. It's in your piss. Yeah. It's in your sweat. It's everywhere. And why is that? Because the, our bodies are designed to operate with good zinc in the body. So mm -hmm. this formula is powerful. The results that we're having, the testimonials we're having, and just take it from me, this might be the most powerful formula we have at Symbiotica, and that's saying a lot. We have three forms of zinc in here. Two of them are trademarked. We also have two forms of copper in here. Copper and zinc might displace each other. That's why we have to have the perfect ratios in there. Uh -huh. And then we also have selenium in there, mm. which creates the trifecta of these three critical minerals that we're not getting in our foods. Most people aren't eating oysters every day. Mm. And sometimes you just want to be able to reach in your cabinet and grab one little capsule I highly recommend eating this with your largest meal of the day mm. because it's that strong until your body app acclimates to it. I'm very, very happy about how this turned out and the results that it's having for both men and women. Excellent. You know, I know that uh, selenium deficiency is linked to uh, heart heart problems, holes in the hearts, heart valve dysfunction. Cancers, yeah, diabetes. Uh, on. New Zealand has a d deficiency of selenium in their soil and they were having a lot of problems with heart problems in the sheep there. Yep. And they tracked it to selenium deficiency. And I've also known of people that needed selenium to heal their heart. So what a great combination. So if you want to get your zinc complex, go to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And as a Living 4D listener, use the code CHECK15 on checkout and get 15% off your zinc complex and any of Symbiotica's amazing products. So enjoy and please take care of yourself. We all need to get our hands together and make the world a better place right now. So if your zinc complex and your Symbiotica products help us do that, then that's a worthy investment. Lots of love. You know, as you were talking about creativity, um, I read a book. I believe it was by Henry Miller. It's called The Art Spirit. Have you ever heard of that one? No, I haven't. Oh my God, I'm going to buy a copy for you and send it to you. It's one of the most powerful books I've ever read. He's an art teacher, this guy, but he, <laughs> it was, it was given to me by a client. Um, and um, he says something profound. He's talking about the art spirit and he's like, I'm a, a an artist. I paint and, and make things and, <clears throat> He says, you know, the art spirit is present because you're adding life to life. 
And I have these beautiful experiences when I'm painting of the vibration of the color and the experience of it unfolding. And I feel myself changing. And as, let, as long as I let my soul guide my brush, then what comes out of it produces this harmonious effect on me and anybody that looks at it. And that's how I use it as a meditation. And why I'm bringing this up is because if we use our creative agency individually and collectively, and we pay attention to this one thing, am I adding life to life or am I destroying life? Am I adding life to my relationships? with myself and others, or am I destroying it with my creative agency? You know, when, like, when I get to talk to you like this, I feel life coming into me. I feel like I'm, I'm getting to share with someone I have deep respect for, and I listen to every word you say because it could change my life. And so the art spirit is there. There's creativity there. We're, we're not saying you're wrong and I'm right. It's like, I get to see how Paul Levy sees the world and I get to, I get the value of all the pain you've worked through and all the challenges and, and the breakdown that you went through because you're carrying that cross gives me a way to wake up and saves me from having to be on that cross in some way. And everyone listening gets that. So there's the art spirits like, ah, wow, a new way to, we're dreaming, you know? So I think if part of our healing is to realize that our creative agency is active when we have that sense that we're adding life to life. Well, I think that's important. That's beautiful. That I, I just love what you're saying, Paul. And it brings up, if I could just share something like, because I've, I've been thinking about this the last year, it, it occurred to me, this was an experience that happened, you know, over 40 years ago. And I won't go into the whole story. You know, I've talked about it before in different podcasts, but and it actually saved my life. Like on the very first day I had my awakening and, you know, and I was so enthusiastic of, of realizing this is a dream that I immediately got brought to a hospital, went to a psych ward and locked up. And, you know, they thought I was having a psychotic break. And within the first minute of that hospital, you know, and I won't go into the whole story, but I met this woman in the lounge. She was a psych patient. She was blind you know, her eyes were opaque. And I went, I found myself and what I, why I'm telling the story and you'll understand is that encoded in what I'm going to describe is both the Watiko virus and its solution. And, and it's creating life. It's creating healing and you'll see. So I see this woman, I'm in this completely ecstatic, extreme state in which I'm realizing, oh my God, this is a dream. It was like, I was waking up. And I see this woman, her eyes are blind, like I was given a script, you know, to say all of a sudden, just falling into my head are the words, all you have to do to see is open your eyes and look. I say this to her, I'm looking in her eyes, I'm getting closer to her as I say it again and again. The whole thing took a minute and she regained her sight. And, you know, the story goes on, I won't tell that part right now, but just it's taken me 40 plus years to, to realize the revelatory aspect and I'm still unpacking it. And what I mean, Watiko is a form of blindness, but it's a self-induced form of blindness. She was hysterically blind. She was causing her own blindness. And then I didn't, you know, for me to say, oh, I healed the blind woman. No, that's not accurate. I didn't, I didn't do anything like that. All I was, I was like this, this, this Uber driver that was in the area of somebody needing uh, help. And I just got sent by central casting and I was playing a role and I was given my lines and I was just an open instrument to, to, to catalyze the healing that was thirsting to happen in the field. She was ready to heal her blindness, but she couldn't do it by herself. So she just needed a reminder, somebody to say those words, abracadabra, the magic words, and then she was able to like, you know, stop creating her hysterical blindness. And I realized, oh my God, that's symbolically showing how to heal Watiko. That in other words, for us just to be, because at that moment, I had snapped out of my narcissistic self fixation of thinking I existed as a separate self. And I was just open hearted with love and compassion available for being in service. And then what happened? Then the universe offered me this woman. And I just didn't even think about what to do. I just knew what to do. I didn't even do anything. 
I was just an instrument for the deeper healing to precipitate itself through me into the field. And that's in a way symbolizing what you're talking about, about just, you know, creating life and creating light and love, you know, that we become agents to do that. Absolutely. In fact, I remembered who it was. It was Rick Rubin, the famous music producer. Him and his wife were working with me and I was helping them with a variety of things. And he handed me this book and he said, this is a gift for you. And I started reading it and I'm like, it was one of those books where any sentence could throw you into such a deep meditation. So I read it for a long time in the sauna and absolutely destroyed it in the sauna from sweating on it so much, but I bought another copy for my library. And so it's, it was just amazing. So I returned him the favor and I sent him a, a book, which if you haven't heard of, it's also excellent. And it's very appropriate because it's about what we're talking about. It's called The Music Lesson by Victor Wooten. And it's an incredible story of how he meets this music teacher who is very kind of like a Don Juan and teaches him all sorts of stuff all in the guise of learning music. So if anyone hasn't read The Music Lesson by Victor Wooten, that's more readable for most people. The Art Spirit is one of those books that's so deep that you have to be ready to digest it and be patient enough to be present with it, or it'll be a bunch of paper, words on paper. And, and you've mentioned the word the self. So I'd love it if you can mean what say what you mean when you use the word self. For example, on page 70 of your new book, it says, to the extent that we are split off from this process of being afflicted by a tico, we experience these mechanisms happening to us. We have lost agency and lost touch with the fact that deep down in our subconscious, we are doing this to ourselves. Now, you know, if you look in the Buddhist conception of the self, you get one idea. If you look at the standard conception of the self, it means I, me, mine, like the ego. So I, I just wondered if you could maybe open that up a bit. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah, totally. With that, that concept of the self, because a person can say, I'm doing it to myself, and they can be right, but we can say we're doing it to the greater self, and we can say that's correct too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. And it's one of those words that's really confusing because it has multiple levels of meaning. And on the one hand, when I use this self, the word self, I think of the work of Jung who talks about the self being the higher self and the idea is for the ego to get into a relationship and, and to have to be, you know, so that the self guides the ego. He calls it the ego self axis. And, you know, like him, in other words, encountering Philemon, who was in a way the embodiment of the, of the inner wisdom guru. And, and Philemon was teaching him stuff he didn't know. So in other words, the ego, Jung's ego was getting in relationship with the self. And he always saw that as a continually deepening, you know, just ongoing sort of this relational process. But then from the Buddhist point of view, and I'm very familiar with that, they talk about the self, you know, as the true nature and, you know, the Buddha self, you know, which is equivalent to the Christ self or, you know, to the true nature, or there are a lot of different names for it. And, and that is compared to, in a way, the sky, the spaciousness of the sky, and that it doesn't have any form, but, you know, it, it embraces all the forms, all, you know, the planets and the stars and the clouds all arise out of the sky and go back into the sky, but the sky itself embraces them and is never touched by any of them. You know, even if there's like a dark thundercloud that's really, you know, black or or if there's you know pollution the the spaciousness which contains it isn't actually ever tainted by that it's always of a higher dimension you know so that's another way or in buddhism they also talk about when you look in in you see a reflection in a mirror the mirror and it, it, it's a great sort of analogy because when you look in a mirror and you see a reflection whether of yourself or of objects you know, they say we then tend to identify um, with the reflection, like whatever the, the object that's being reflected. Now, think about the reflection as being a thought form. So whatever thought form we have that arises in our, the spaciousness of our mind, 
we will tend, and those thought forms are like a little, like this dream, like a mini dream. We then will absorb in the thought form, we'll embody it, we'll identify with it. And, and that's like in Buddhism, they say to identify with the reflection in the mirror. But that's a mistake because our true nature is likened to that mirror. And the mirror is always there. It's always present. It's never tainted. No matter how vile the object is, the mirror always is, it's not stained or dirtied or sullied by how, you know, the, the object that it's reflecting. And even more than that, you, we would never recognize the mirror without the object and the reflections. The reflections would seemingly obscure the silver surface of the mirror are actually revealing it. Okay. And so that's amazing that think about the reflections in the mirror. They're like our thought forms. And a lot of us are bothered by our thoughts or conditioned by our thoughts. We want to get rid of our thoughts or silence our thoughts. But in Buddhism, they say, well, the thought forms are actually the expression of our true nature. They're not separate from it at all. There's nothing. And so if you recognize that, then all of a sudden you're not conditioned by your thoughts. You're not bothered by your thoughts. And instead of your thoughts creating you, you can literally create with your thoughts. Okay. So it's a thing, you know, I can just go on and on about this, but it's something that I just continually in my own practice, I'm, I'm, you know, just ever sort of in a deepening way, kind of integrating my realization, you know? Yeah. I, I tell my students that a mirror is a perfect metaphor for unconditional love. And that we must remember, if source is unconditional love, then the answer to every thought, word, or desire is yes. So there we are, back to using our creative agency. If you're dreaming up dragons, goblins, and terrible things, the answer is yes. But if you awaken and say, I can use that creative agency to create something beautiful and something that enhances my life and my relationship, the answer is yes. Because we're all really agents of unconditional love having an experience for itself. And in my new book that I'm writing, I, I, I inform people. I say, unconditional love couldn't know itself unconditionally. So it had to create conditions so that it could love itself unconditionally. And the analogy I give is, have you ever seen a mirror refuse somebody because they were ugly or had a certain skin color or they were fat or they were skinny? Or they're a mean. No. The mirror is unconditionally loving, but it had to create conditions so it had something to love, which is actually itself. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. I wow, I really love what you just described, you know. And um and it's 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 really cool because you know, I've been fortunate in that I have, you know, for years, um I've had these great teachers, you know, who I'm very close with. You know, they're sort of like family members. Now, you know, because I haven't had a family for so many years and and they embody this, you know, because they're real, genuine, authentic teachers, you know, spiritual teachers, and they embody love and they embody compassion. And they're always talking about that when you have the realization of your nature, our nature is love. It is compassion. You know, and that's why when people ask me, oh, how can I awaken to the dream? You know, I want to see the dream like nature. And, and I'll say, well, you know, in Buddhism, they say when you have a real awakening experience, it's always the combination of two factors of what's called emptiness and compassion. And emptiness, that's lucidity. That's to be, think about it being in a dream at night and recognizing, oh, this world that I thought of is solid and separate and objective. It's actually, I'm just in my own psyche. It's actually not separate from my own energy. It actually is me. I'm inside of myself, inside of my own mind with a capital M. That's to have, that's to have this lucid moment and that's to realize the emptiness and including what's empty is the self that's realizing it. There's no, there's no thing that you realize the whole realization is empty, but then that's always combined with compassion. That if you just have the realization of emptiness, if you just have the lucidity without the compassion, or you just have the compassion without the realization of the emptiness, that's not the true awakening. They're always co-joined. And, um, 
you know, so when people ask me, oh, how can I, can I recognize the dreamlike nature of reality? I always say like, well, you know, one easy way is just to cultivate compassion, is to really work on yourself and to deepen your genuine compassion. And it's like a mathematical equation. The more you're doing that, the more probable, you know, probabilistic, more probably you will then, you know, have those, those lucid moments and, and have the realization of emptiness. And, um, yeah, and that's something, you know, I mean, even I think about His Holiness Dalai Lama. He's always saying, Oh, I'm always deepening my altruism and deepening my compassion. And, you know, in Buddhism, they talk about the precious bodhicitta and the bodhicitta. It's the very thing you start with when you do practice. You cultivate bodhicitta. And then when you become fully enlightened, what do you get? Bodhicitta. And bodhicitta is the good heart. It's the enlightened heart. And His Holiness just describes it as the good heart. And, and interestingly, my teachers say, with all of us, they, we all have this, this wound. And the, the greatest wound is a closed heart. you know. And then it armors us. It keeps us separate from other people, from life, and from ourselves. So to the extent that we can really just cultivate compassion and open our heart, you know, that's the extent we're really um, investing our creative energy in the right way. Yeah, it reminds me of how I handle people when they start pressuring me because I'm not going to let myself be uh, vaccinated. And they, you know, of course, they all have their own rants and raves. And I say, well, look, thank you for doing that because there's a grand experiment going on and I'm doing you a favor and you're doing me a favor. You're showing me the outcome of that option in the study. And I'm going to show you the option that I'm taking. So we get to see what happens in this big science experiment that's going on. And we can't have real science without a control group. So I'm the control group and you're in the experiment. So I'm going to risk the virus without the vaccination so you can see what happens and you're going to risk the virus with the vaccination. So thank you. I really appreciate you doing that for me. And I found when I present it to people that way, it shifts them from being polar against me to realizing, wow, to do real science, you have to have a control group and you have to have somebody taking the medicine. And so when they re when I say, look, we're all working for each other. We're all doing this experiment together. The difference is you don't want to make me the bad guy and I don't want to make you the bad guy, but we really do need to ask ourselves the bigger question. And how did this happen in the first place? Because if we just keep running experiment after experiment without looking at the etiology of the disease that we're trying to address, then we're just going to get more of the same. And we don't have room for much more of that before we're all dead <laughs> just because of the underlying factor is much bigger than any virus. It's, it, unless you go to Wetiko, then we now we're at the real root cause. And I think that's the beauty of our conversation. We're talking about the authentic root cause. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say what you just shared, that was incredibly inspiring, you know, because I, I encounter that all the time too around the vaccine, <laughs> you know, yeah. and um you know, and, and I've chosen, I'm choosing not to get vaccinated, you know, and I have, I have my own reasons and, um, and, you know, and at least in part, my unconscious is one of the reasons is that, you know, I have incredibly crystal clear dreams, unequivocal dreams that, you know, about the vaccine and, you know, and, and I've learned, no, I have such a deep relationship with my unconscious. I know. Oh, that it's never wrong, you know. I know, mm -hmm. and it's me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so me the way too. you just describe that is beautiful, and it's interesting because I was, you know, I, I do a lot of these interviews or talks or whatever, and for for one of them, I was asked in the Q and A, "Oh, could you talk about the vaccines?" And it was a really, it was like one of those moments, like, "Uh oh, what is he going to say?" <laughs> and, you know, because I don't want to polarize people and, you know, I don't want to lay a trip on people or try to convince people or, or otherize anybody. And so how I answered it, I basically said, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. The whole vaccine topic is so polarizing. There's the anti-vaccine, the pro-vaccine. 
a lot of them are just otherizing each other. They're demonizing each other. They're scapegoating each other. And I go, and Watiko feeds off of polarization. So that's literally feeding, you know, Watiko. And what I would love to put out is that I think what would be really helpful in this moment in time that we're living through, it's sort of like a superhero power is, you know, because so many people are, they're identified with their point of view as being true. Oh, I'm in possession of the truth. And if you ask them, well, how did you come to that opinion? Oh, I read an article or I, I read the New York Times or I listened to NPR and I'm like, oh my God, you know, so that's different than really having this realization and, you know, based on your own experience of the truth of what you're talking about. And um, so what I'm trying to present to people is to just not get fixed in a viewpoint, in any viewpoint, and actually try and entertain how the other point of view is seeing things. And what are they seeing that you're not? And what is their blind spot? And are they seeing your blind spot? And all of a sudden, developing this omni-perspectival awareness can be incredibly helpful. But keep in mind, even that can be usurped by Watiko, because I've I've spoken to people who are like, oh, well, according to quantum physics, you know, both A and B are true, and and four valued logic, and you and everything yeah. is both true and not true, and they're using that to justify their incredibly stupid <laughs> and ignorant beliefs, and so they're using the the quantum gnosis to justify their own ignorance, and so the fact that yeah, you know. It's like, well, you know, quantum physics is saying, well, everything is both true and not true. That doesn't preclude taking a stand at a certain point. And once you have enough data points and, and have the realization that something, you know, in your, in your own, you know, mind are convinced that it's true. And who knows? You might be fooling yourself, but it's our, it's also this moral act. If you feel like, for example, if I feel like, you know, way back in the day when the British, when Paul Revere was like, the British are coming, the British are coming. And if somebody were to say, well, they're coming and not coming and, you know, it's just your opinion <laughs> and how do you know? No, then they'll get, they would get killed. You know, the point <laughs> is when you see, when you actually have the realization that there's like this evil force that's destructive, that's going to do harm to your loved ones and to you. You know, the question is, do you have enough courage to actually speak the truth of what, what your experience is? And, and so that's, you know, so that's a real question. And, uh, but basically what I, I just loved your answer. And I'm just trying to add my little two cents of that for <laughs> any of us to not get caught in a viewpoint and to really develop that omniperspectival awareness that I think really helps to dispel what <laughs> you you made me, you, 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 you made something pop into my head. I got to share it with you when you were talking about, a, I'm coming, I'm not coming, you know, multi-valued logic. Uh, what came to me is uh, people need to realize life is like sex. You're either coming or you're not. <laughs> That's a great bumper sticker. Yeah. Oh yeah, let's do it. Oh God. I know exactly what you mean, but you know how I handle that? And this is how I teach my patients and my students to handle that. I say, look, the mind is a duality machine. And so you're going to find, if you look at any topic deeply, and, I, and the example I give my students, I say, you go look up cold water therapy, like cold plunges and cold dips. And you will find all sorts of highly qualified doctors saying you should never do that. It can make you sick. And then you'll find Wim Hof saying it'll turn you into Superman. You look up hot water. Never do it. Oh, it's great for this. Great for that. Look up vitamin C. Don't use it. Do use it. Look up anything. Vaccines. Don't use them. Do use them. I see that's what Steiner describes as the opportunity for the birth of the awareness soul. And the awareness soul begins the day you start asking, is it really true? Is it really true that the vaccine is the answer? Is it really true that it isn't the answer? And what you'll find is you'll find all these checkmates. So the only way to get out of it is to go to your soul, which is both your unconscious and your superconscious, and get empty. 
and don't have any idea in your head because if you're weighted to one side and you, then you're not going to hear your soul, you're going to hear your ego's answer. And that's the hard part of working with the soul. You've got to empty yourself so completely that you're willing to hear an answer that goes against your belief system or all you'll do is reinforce your own belief system and say your soul told it to you. And then when you're laying on the hospital dead bed dying, you'll say, well, dear soul, why did you tell me to do that? And your soul will say, I didn't tell you that. You told yourself that. You didn't listen to what I said. <laughs> so the point I'm saying is when, whenever we have these checkmate situations, that's where we have to go into the level of the awareness soul and say, is it really true? And then don't go out of duality, post the question, but go into a non-dual state so you're receptive when the answer comes, and then trust the guidance. And the reason it's a spiritual practice is because you will find until you learn to empty yourself and be brave enough to hear something that opposes your viewpoint, you're never really listening to the voice of God. You're always listening to your own programming. And that's why it's a practice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's beautiful. I'm just smiling so much, Paul, as you're describing that because that so maps onto my experience. Like, think about what I was talking about, you know, with the ego self access in Young with Philemon and all of a sudden developing like, uh, you know, really this, this relationship, an intimate relationship with the self. And, you know, where I was thinking about it with reference to my own process is you know so here i am and i i i do these books that i write and you know and i write every morning and um typically in the morning when i get up and i'm like brushing my teeth or something i'm getting downloads and it's like i'm getting these these dictates from the boss and at that point i'm just the employee and i've learned to differentiate when it's a download from on high you know from my higher self and then, then I'm just like paying attention and it's, you know, teaching me and it's telling me and showing me, here's what you're going to write about today. And here's how you're going to write about it. And, and I've learned to make a distinction between that and just like, you know, the sort of the, the mind, sort of the, the squirrel cage neurotic monkey mind. That's just like, you know, and we, we're all familiar with that. But the other one where we get the download from our higher self, there's a different signature there's a different there energy. is i call it the energy signature of the soul yeah i see you you, beautiful. you really have to spend time learning the difference between the energy signature of your ego and the energy signature of your soul and if you don't spend time asking questions to your soul that your ego doesn't give a shit about like what color socks should i wear today uh should i eat two carrots or one then you're always going to be trying to get important answers to important questions, but not realizing that your ego is too involved. And I'm going to give you a great example for all the listeners of a real profound experience I had. This is after 20 years of working with my soul. When Angie got pregnant, I was 54. She got pregnant with Mana and I had no interest in being a father again. I'm like, Jesus, this is the last thing I wanted at 54. I want to go off and freaking join a monastery and get a <laughs> retire and paint and meditate with trees uh, you know like i already have a son i know what it's like to be a parent it's a lot of work and i got thousands of students so i like don't need more kids so when she got pregnant i said to my soul is is my child going to be a boy or a girl and the answer that came back was a girl i'm like yes i really want to have a girl and so I asked over and over again, and I remember Angie saying a few times, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have a girl because there is so damn much energy inside of me. And women say that when they have a girl, they're more calm inside. And, you know, Mana's like doing gymnastics in their arms and legs sticking out of the woo, out of the belly. And, and so when Mana came out and we, and he was a boy, I was like, what the hell? How did that happen? My soul told me over, I asked, I must have asked 50 times. My soul told me I was going to have a girl. And so as soon as I got home, I got my son and went into meditation and said, what the hell? You told me I was going to have a girl and I believed you. And my soul said, no, no, I told you you were going to have a boy, but you wanted a girl so bad. You didn't listen to me. You just kept telling yourself you were having a girl. You did not listen to me. 
I and my so my soul is saying, if you really want to hear me, you've got to stop hearing yourself. And that's the lesson here, isn't it? <laughs> I'm like, oh you shit. Know, totally, totally. That's and the thing which is which is so beautiful about what you're describing, and we've all done that. We've all, you know, fooled ourselves. We're masters at deceiving ourselves. <laughs> yeah. you know? And um and it's so interesting because then when you sort of distinguish that uh, the neurotic mind or just your own ego mind from the, the true self and you actually pay attention in a way, then you distinguish yourself. It's actually by doing that, you're actually participating in the creation of your, of your true self. And um, so, you know, and this goes back to once again, the profound importance of being creative as far as, you know, being the medicine for Watiko. And, um, and I just love that story because who can't relate to that? Who hasn't <laughs> fooled themselves in that way? You know, I mean, that's where we're, we're, we're these geniuses. If people think, oh, no, I'm not a genius. Oh, yes, you are. Look at what a genius you are of tricking yourself out of your own right <laughs> you yeah. know, yeah. Too, too good. Just yeah. absolutely masterful at it. And that brings up my point. Look how good we are at tricking ourselves into create what we don't want. Why don't we just get still together, listen to people like Paul Levy and whoever else that we know is wise because their life reflects it, and learn to use that very power to create what we all can enjoy together and make life sustainable so we can keep practicing instead of having to go back to the drawing board and go, well, we fucked that one up. Hi, everybody. I sure hope you're enjoying the podcast today. You know, it's said that most people are either in too much of a rush to prepare fresh organic greens, be they vegetables or green fruits like fresh green apples, and end up grazing on inferior foods. But it comes with a cost. Nutrient depletion, reduced capacity to handle stress, reduced immune resilience, and you age more rapidly. But Organifi comes to our aid again with an amazingly tasty, nutritious addition their new crispy apple green juice. But it's more than just another apple drink. It's packed with your favorite adaptogens and superfoods. Some key features of Organifi's new crisp apple green juice are delicious taste from organic crisp apples, organic whole apple sources hand-picked, including Golden Delicious from Washington, Northern Spy, Macintosh, Ida Red, and Empire from Ontario, Canada. The new crisp apple green juice is formulated with the highest quality ashwagandha at an effective dose of 600 milligrams for helping your body handle stress more effectively. And it's low sugar, only 2 grams per serving, but the taste is amazing for such a low sugar drink. Just add water, mix, and experience the joy of real food real fast. Go to Organifi.com, O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and save 20% on Organifi products when you enter your Living 4D discount code, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20 during checkout. That's check 20 for your 20% discount on Organifi products during checkout. Enjoy Organifi's new crisp apple green juice. The thing I wanted to say, I'm, I'm noticing I have this reaction when you, you know, refer to me as this wise person because, you know, and I think this might be helpful for people. I'm just someone who, you know, went through this unbelievable trauma and like this wounding. And, you know, and I won't go into the story, you know, right now, you know, I have, I've written a book about it. You know, I mean, I'm happy to talk about it some other time. But it was like, it almost killed me and it created such enormous suffering. And I didn't realize at the time I couldn't have that I was, you know, taking part in this initiatory ordeal, you know, and, um, and it was very probabilistic. I was either going to be completely fucked up, you know, or I was going to, you know, somehow go through it and keep my heart open and cultivate awareness and discover my gifts. And so in a way, you know, I'm thankful that I think I've, I've manifested the, the latter, but I'm kind of embodying the archetype of like the, the, the healer who has a wound, like the wounded the healer, wounded, the wounded healer. And that, you know, why I bring that up 
is because so many, we're all wounded. We're all, I mean, think about just the last two years. It's an incredible over the top trauma. We're, we're a species in trauma. And, and yet there's a way we, you know, when we have our wound, um, there's a way of absorbing it and identifying with it, uh, you know, in a way that, oh, I'm just wounded and, oh, you know, I won't really be okay until I heal my wound, but it never gets healed. And then I'm just feeling like this partial fragmented person. But there's another way of carrying your wound where your wound, you can recognize that it was this sort of higher dimensional event. It was this, this numinous event that actually, like you were saying before, like crack you open so that the love and the light can come both in and come out of you. And um, it, so the wound, that's the archetype of the wounded healer that in a way it's an incurable wound, but it becomes the portal to these incredible gifts. And the wounded healer is related to the figure of the shaman. And I'm certainly no shaman. I'll joke with my friends only in my, in my dreams am I a shaman. But the point is, we're all shamans. We're all shamans, wounded healers in training, and that that's the deeper archetype that's activated. You know, we're going through a death rebirth experience. We're descending into the darkness of the unconscious. And to the extent we don't split off from that and just indulge our habitual patterns and our addictions and, you know, identify with our wounds, you know, and that's a real danger. And a lot of people do that. But if we're able to just presence our wound and and to carry it in a certain way, it will then it becomes a doorway, you know, to our nature, to our true nature. And I can talk about this with authority because, you know, like people who who know me really well, I mean, I'm the last thing from an enlightened person. No, I'm just I have my stuff, my woundedness, my trauma, but the way I carry it it actually give it it just connects me with this incredible creative source that just always comes through me and why i'm sharing that and being just like really vulnerable is because i think that that's all of us and that can really help to take us out of the, the pathologizing ourselves thinking there's something wrong with us and just having the recognition oh no this is i'm i'm an instantiation of the of the macrocosm of the collective condition I mean, that's what the shaman does. The shaman will literally take on the illness that the person or the community they're working with is suffering from, and taking it on means they'll they'll have it out with it, but they'll take it within themselves and they'll fall ill, and they will experience the illness from the inside, subjectively. But then they will take that experience of falling ill as the actual event and process through which they even more deeply connect with their soul, with who they are, with the self. And then by doing that energetically, that, that healing that they've experienced through the experience of being wounded and reconnecting with themselves with their wholeness, non-locally energetically gets, gets registered and expressed non-locally through the whole universe. And so we have all been made sick by the collective psychosis. And that's what makes us potentially shamans in training. And if we could carry that sickness, in a way that more deeply connects us with our creativity, with our nature, then we're actually being, you know, part of the solution. Well, the other thing about it too is that if you look at it like a science experiment that we've been running over and over again for eons, we can, okay, we, at some point we just got to all say, okay, uh, we've now done this 82 billion times. We know <laughs> that we're really good at producing what we don't want. We know we're good at hurting each other. We know we're good at making each other sick. We know we're good at avoiding responsibility, dot, dot, dot. So now we got to say, how about if we run the other experiment and see what we can create positively that connects us, that is an expression of love, that is converting Watiko into its opposing power. How about instead of doing the 18th million experiment to see what it looks like when you frown in a mirror and stand with poor posture, you try smiling and standing with good posture and say, I love me. I can't wait to share me with the world today. I got to go out and share my love, right? Because we've already done the other experiment enough. I mean, at what point does the double blind journal agree? Okay, you got a definite result here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. It makes me think what you're saying, you know, as an artist, you know, I've been creating um, this happening, an art happening 
for years. And it's free membership and full benefits for everyone. And it's an art happening called Global Awakening, you know, that we we can realize that we can all hook up with each other. You know, like I was saying, get in phase, get in sync with each other, you know, and in a way support each other's awakening, you know, and we can help to actually wake ourselves up and to stabilize that lucidity and, and that can go viral. And that's, you know, so what, what I was saying before about, you know, the importance of creativity and how it's like a flatland idea just to be painting and drawing. No. Every, every moment of our lives is creative. We are creative beings, you know? And some people are so genius at being creative, they will literally create the experience that they're not creative. And they will absolutely draw all the evidence confirming in their life, no, I'm completely not creative. And what they've done, they've used their creative genius to create the experience of not being creative. And it's mind-blowing. Wow, what a genius you are. How creative you are that you've created that. But that's what you're pointing at. That's like one person's example of what we're doing collectively. And what about if we actually just re, you know, rechannel that energy instead of in a way of killing us in a way that's actually gonna, gonna help us to, to in a way discover who we are. And that's in a way, in a sense, what all this is about. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's so many people out there that are kind of think spirituality is foo foo and blah, blah, blah. So I say, it could, let's just be completely and utterly rational. How many times have you used your creative energy to create pain and dysfunction in your relationships? Just be brutally logical. A billion, (laughs) 10 billion. Okay, good. Now let's be really logical. Let's change your orientation and think about what it is that you really want and need in your life to be healthy and vital and creative and contribute to the world. And run the experiment. Be brutally honest with yourself and be as rational as you can and see it as a scientific experiment. Throw the soul talk and the other shit out the window if you want to. Pay attention to what you're putting into the test tube every day and what's coming out of it. And you can be the hardest, most rigid scientist in the world. And guess what? You will be dead shocked at the results you get. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> be as rational as you can be. I'd love to see that. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing, which is so, I, I just, I'm so glad you said that because I just thought of this. Like the thing about um, the Watiko virus, it doesn't even exist. There is no such thing. It has no independent intrinsic existence at all. And yet it can kill us. You know, <laughs> that's, that, that's, that, that's the paradox. And that's reflecting that it's like, yeah, it's tapping into our unconscious power that we haven't tapped into ourselves and um you know so it's it's so it's so interesting um because i don't want to you know kind of invoke in the listeners this fear of that oh there's this like mind virus and i need to be afraid of it and all that no 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 because the watiko mind virus it feeds off of fear it's just totally you know, in a sense, our own creative imagination turned against us in a way that's actually killing us. So it's pointing at the incredible creative power that we have, you know, and um, yeah, no, I'm just loving, I mean, talking to you, Paul, it's so cool because it's like, yeah, you know, when you talk to someone and, you know, they speak the same language and, you know, and you feel really heard and appreciated, I think we're both feeling that. You know, it's, it's awesome. I think we're both old enough to have beaten the shit out of ourselves enough times to say it's time for another experiment. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the, right. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the thing. What you just said is so right on. Because in essence, in Watiko, the way of understanding Watiko is like, yeah, we're beating the shit out of ourselves. It's like we're pinching ourselves and we're, we're yelling, ouch, it hurts. How do I, can you make it stop? And you're <laughs> somebody else is doing it to you. Instead of the idea being, well, how do you have the experience that you're the one who's doing it to yourself? And that's the thing about Watiko. When I say it has no power over us at all, but it only has power over us when we collude with it. We give away our, because it can't steal our soul, but it can trick us into giving our soul away. So that's a key thing that I always try to work with with people is how are you colluding 
with Watiko. And then with the whole creative process, you know, and I'm always, you know, emphasizing the profound importance of being creative in whatever way. It doesn't make a difference what the medium, but then I'm always interested in what is the story. If people, like so many people say, oh, I'm not fully creative or I'm feeling blocked or stuck. And I'm like, okay, what's stopping you? What is, what is the story you're telling yourself that's stopping you from fully just stepping into your creativity? And what I've noticed in myself is that, you know, for a number of years, right when I would be like about to have a breakthrough, whether I was painting or drawing or writing or whatever it was I was doing, there would be this incredible resistance. And if I indulged in that resistance, oh, let me just go away. Let me know there's nothing here for me today. Let me, then I wouldn't have the breakthrough. But I've learned the greater the resistance, the greater the breakthrough. And it was interesting. This is related. There was one time after I got out of the last hospital and, you know, which was 82. And then I found these great teachers, these, these Tibetan, these lamas who, you know, they became like family members and, and I would be seeing them all the time. And I was always telling them how much pain I was in and the trauma. And I noticed they were listening and taking me really, you know, they were honoring me, but they, they weren't getting hooked. They weren't taking me seriously. It was like they were in relationship to the part of me that was whole and healed and awake. And they could do that because they saw, because they were in touch with the part of them that was whole and healed and awake. And I've realized, oh my God, that's kind of what I do. And I think what, what any real healer does is whenever they're working with someone, they see their story and their identification with being wounded. That's the Halloween costume. That's what I call it. And they don't get hooked by that. But to the extent that you're in touch with your own wholeness, you see the other person in their wholeness as already being whole, already being healed. And by the lamas doing that to me, it helped me to step into the part of me that was healed, you know? And one time, though, I was talking to them about the demons and the trauma and the evil and the abuse from my father, and they said to me something I'll never forget. I Right away, I, I heard the truth of it. They said, Paul, it's because you have such potential for light that the demons are even interested. And I realized that's not just me. That's all of us, you know? And so in other words, every day, so for example, there was my friend, a really good friend, he did the audio book for the new book because I, I didn't want to read it and, and he was really good at it. So I, you know, I asked him to read it and he's this, this minister. That's what he does for a living. And he said to me, he goes, Paul, I couldn't believe what happened. Once I began to read your book, I was like attacked by demons like every day. I it. And I began laughing and laughing and going, well, what do you think it was right? What do you, what do you think it was like to write the book? Because uh, yeah. I was like every day getting attacked by these demons. But I took that as, oh, this is a sign I'm on the right path. Great. You know, instead of like, wow, I'm really fucked up and I have a problem, it was like, no, this is this is telling me I'm like, like this. Yeah, I'm like on the right path. So, you know, I, I just wanted, I'm glad to remember to say that because I wanted your listeners to hear that, you know. Oh, it's great. Well, I have to say you inspired a new definition of mind for me that I think I'll have to email to Dr. Dan Siegel to go with his mind. Something that doesn't exist but can kill you. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Many, lots of my students and friends have asked me over the years, can you tell me what a shaman really is? Because it's hard to define that. And I say, yes, I can. A shaman is someone who's played all the games you're playing with yourself, but they're much better at them than you are, so they can easily recognize yours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That and plus, like in, in physics, the quantum physicists, the founding fathers, they were saying, no, there's no such thing as experts. We're all amateurs, but what, what we're expert in, we know where all the mistakes are because we've made them. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so good. Uh, from my studies on your works on Watiko, it seems that Watiko fits the definition of an entity, be it a thought form or an egregore. Um, in Mark Stavish's book titled Egregores, he states that egregore, uh, he states uh, regarding egregores that an egregore is an entity that is an artificial being whose creator or creators become its slaves. If you agree that Watiko as an egregore fits that classification, 
What is it within human beings that seems to have them forever creating such entities and ultimately being enslaved by them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I totally agree with that. I mean, I have a like a whole section on egregores in my in my new book. Yeah, I read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Good. No, no, it's totally a trip. And it's like the sorcerer's apprentice who like conjures up like from the bones of a dead tiger, conjures up the tiger, and then the tiger devours the apprentice. It's like that. I mean, that's we're we are that sorcerer's apprentice where we we have this power beyond measure with these magicians, but we're using our magic in a way that's killing us. It's so perverse and it's so insane, you know, but when you see it, I mean, it's just such a mind-blowing thing. And the idea of an egregore, it's so interesting because in psychology speak, they talk about autonomous complexes that, you know, when we get traumatized, you know, and by definition of trauma is something we can't integrate in the normal way, we can't symbolize it, it's overwhelming. So we split. We become, you know, disassociated. And then if we don't, you know, integrate that split off part, it develops an autonomy of its own. That's why, you know, in psychology, they're called autonomous complexes that will manifest as if they have this life and independent will of its own. And, and the indigenous people call autonomous complexes. That's what they, they would call a demon. And, and so all of this is related to an egregore that an egregore actually doesn't even in independently exist. It was mind, it was conjured up by the practitioner's mind. And there are people who are pointing out, yeah, it's like there's a collective egregore, you know, striding society, you know, in our world that we have dreamed up. That's what I mean when I say Watiko is a dreamed up phenomena. Like my, my next book on Watiko, due out in a year, is undreaming Watiko, you know, and it's pointing out that, yeah, because we've created Watiko, we've dreamed up Watiko, we can undream it. Just like an egregore, you can uncreate it. Yeah, I, I love that. So I'm going to go to a section of your book here, because this is a, an interesting topic I want to hear your thoughts on. Um, so when it comes to healing with Tico, in your book, starting at the bottom of page 69 and then continuing on page 70, you were referring to the fact that egregores are similar to Tibetan tulpas, which I've studied. And you state, as hard as a tulpa is to create, the self-created thought forms are considered even more difficult once having taken form to uncreate and dissolve. Imagine how much more challenging it would be to dissolve a collectively dreamed up egregore, a human created mutually shared thought form. The challenge, however, starts with each one of us right now in this moment. Once a critical mass is reached, of people who are dreaming up the tulpa egregore dissolution, the tulpa egregore will indeed dissolve <clears throat> in no time at all. Now, when I read that, because I've studied egregores quite a lot in thought forms and Ledbetter's work and Annie Besant and blah, 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 and I also work with them in people that come to me with what we would call possessions and multiple personality disorders, there's a collection of complexes. Um, <clears throat> this came to me to to dialogue with you on. I bring this up because the energy of an egregore is highly or heavily linked to any ritual practice associated with it. And to abolish an egregore, all such practices must be completely stopped or the egregore is fed and enlivened again. This means, and I know for many reasons that this is true, me, that's me speaking here, that we must actually carefully look at what rituals we have collectively participated in that spawned or do spawn Watiko and its current embodiment in the pandemic. Historically, when Christians, Romans, and others invaded other territories where people held belief systems that were contradictory to their captors or the invaders, then what they would do is they would burn every statue or building like churches, any this is why we see so many sculptures in these places with their faces chopped off because they believe that you had to destroy any of the insignia or any of the ritual uh, tools that supported the practice of creating the egregore that they wanted to get rid of. And so um, I've got a lot written down there, but uh, I'll jump to the point. The point is, is that an egregore is fed by the rituals that are linked to the creation of it. 
And we are, as a world culture, we have a lot of political rituals. We have a lot of business rituals. We have a lot of religious rituals. Um, we have a lot of <laughs> banking rituals. We have a lot of medical rituals that are all feeding into Wetiko. So if we just stop dreaming it, but we keep doing the same rituals, it might disappear for a minute. But when, it, when I look at the most scholarly research I can find on egregores, one of the things that comes out in the healing of a person who's suffering from an egregore, if you're studying black magic and you've got a bunch of tools you use in your rituals, you're supposed to destroy them. If you've got books you've been using, you're supposed to destroy them. Because if you keep associating with those tools and practices, it keeps feeding the egregore. So I'm just curious. With what you've shared in your book and what I'm sharing here, how important do you think it is for us to potentially destroy or eliminate objects, symbols, and practices that we've been using for thousands of years that are keep bringing us back into connection with that egregore? Yeah, no, I I, I hear you. That's a, that's a great question. And, um, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, on, you know, on one hand, I'm right with you. I totally agree, um, you know, that uh, the rituals, the ceremony, the objects are the means through which the egregore takes on seeming substantial form. But on the other hand, you know, the rituals and ceremonies and objects are themselves just this superficial aspect. There's something deeper and that something deeper is the mind with a capital M. You know, and what you're pointing at is that we have to find another way of of being of of living, of being in relationship with each other, with ourselves, and with the world, with the environment, with nature. You know, and but just to even associate even further, you know, an egregore, and and we're talking, you know, like we were saying, a collective egregore, and um, you know, or you know, here's what you know, the whole Watiko. Um, demon, you know, being dreamed up and, you know, taking over our world, so to speak, is um, one way of understanding what's happening. I keep on talking about we, we are these creative geniuses. That's our nature. You know, we're made in the image of our creator. And a way of understanding this that is super awesome is as follows. Imagine, imagine that you're in a night dream, right? And in the night dream, now what is a night dream? But it's a reflection of your mind right? Whatever perspective you're holding in your mind just is reflected and instantaneously expressed by the night dream because the night dream is just a projection of your own mind. And um, so say you're holding a viewpoint. Say the viewpoint is, for example, that the world you're living in, in that dream is objective. So it's the classical Newtonian pre-quantum physics world, because even though quantum physics has come into our world a hundred years ago and come into our mind, there we still have this like sort of objective reality hangover in our unconscious. A lot of us still think that this is objective separate from us. And, but say in that dream, you're holding a viewpoint of this is an objective world. It's solid. It's separate. It's independent. You hold that viewpoint. The dream will then shape shift and instantaneously give you all the evidence. It'll manifest in a way that confirms your viewpoint in no time at all. And now all of a sudden you have the proof that your viewpoint is true. So you become even more fixed in your viewpoint. And the more fixed in your viewpoint you are, the more the dream will just reflect back, giving you evidence, confirming the viewpoint in a self-reinforcing feedback loop that, you know, just continues ad infinitum, whose source is your own mind, you know, with a capital M. And the point is, is that take a look at what I've just described. We've used our incredible powers of reality creation to actually entrance ourselves and that's the real egregore okay and then we dream up the world to reflect back our fixed viewpoint and our unconscious viewpoint you know and we've disconnected from that we like it, it reminds me i remember I, I i don't think i've ever said this on on an interview but i thought about it in the last year when I was in college, there was one time during like a spring break or something, a bunch of me and my friends, we got together, you know, when we were off from school to play like softball or something. And, and I was, I was up at bat and, and there was this person who was pitching 
And she obviously didn't know baseball very well. And I was just like, you know, taking my check swings, like getting ready. And, and, and I kept on like, you know, getting ready and taking my check swings, just waiting for her to pitch the ball. And she started screaming at me going, stop that, stop that. And I, <laughs> I just like began cracking up because she didn't realize the way to make me to stop that was to pitch the ball. She was completely yeah. cut off from her agency. That as soon as she picked the ball, I would I would stop. But she was not aware of that, and she just wasn't in touch with her own power. And I realized, oh my God, that's a perfect symbol for us. We don't realize our creative power, you know. So in a way, and that's at the bottom of the real egregore. Sometimes I'm in a hurry, and in a hurry between engagements, lunch, or dinner. And dinner won't be ready for a while, so I just want to eat something delicious that's quick and easy. And that is when I say, thank God for Paleo Valley. Paleo Valley has extremely high standards and only uses the highest quality, cleanest sources for their animal and plant food products. And they have excellent jerky meats neatly packaged so you can take them anywhere and never be stuck without something great to feed your beautiful body and stabilize your mind. I love their pasture-raised turkey sticks in the original and cranberry orange flavor. Angie, Penny, and the kids absolutely love their grass-fed beef sticks, which come in jalapeno summer sausage, garlic summer sausage, teriyaki, and original flavors. I can assure you Paleo Valley's meat sticks are so good you could literally make a meal of them or have them as snacks and you'd feel satisfied and satiated and know you've fed your body top-quality nutrition that will make your cells dance for joy. Yoo-hoo! Paleo Valley has lots of other great additions to meet your food and nutrition needs, and their website is loaded with great articles, podcasts, recipes, and more. Go to www.paleovalley.com to get your 15% Living 4D discount. Use the code CHECK15, all small case, C-H-E-K-15 on checkout. The whole family will be satiated, nourished, and glad you did. I have another one for you here, and we're doing pretty good. I think in, we've covered almost every question I had now in our dialogue. They just kind of came up all by themselves, which is pretty cool. So it is known that when people try to free themselves from religions, groups, or organizations that have generated negative, dangerous egregores, that they go through a withdrawal period like addicts do. During this period, one of the suggestions is that such people need to align themselves with opposing but equally powerful forces, organizations, or people that support their transition, or they're likely to consciously or unconsciously be back, drawn back to the egregore that previously hurt them. Considering how many millions of people worldwide have obviously become victims of Witiko and the pandemic expression of Witiko, what suggestions do you have in this regard? Does that make sense to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's almost like um, when when there's a breakup in a relationship. And yeah, then, you got to go. And then you just got to go just to someone hate, that supports you. Yeah, and you just got to hate the other person for a little while before you get back in balance and remember their good side type of thing. And because we are talking, I mean, there's an incredible mind control that's happening. I mean, that's the real war in our world is the war on consciousness. And, um, you know, with all the propaganda and misinformation, and, you know, like they say, it's, it's not that hard to bamboozle someone, but it's way harder to snap them out of their bamboozlement. And for that, for that, you need support. And, um, you know, when I've just been struck by no matter how much like evidence or, you know, you can, you can supply to someone, you know, who's under a spell, they're just going to integrate it to confirm their viewpoint. And, um, and it is very much like people in cults when they, yes, you know, exactly what I'm of thinking that. of. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, exactly. And no, so it's really important, you know, and the thing is, it's not so much important to like support them into identifying with, you know, any particular viewpoint with your viewpoint, but just to connect them with their own authority, with their own, because that's, that's the ultimate abuse is when we take away, we, we somehow, um, you know, kind of take away people's authority with reference to their own experience. And that was what that was, I could not believe when I was like being, being locked up in psychiatry, 
they would be basically asking me, well, tell me what your experience that you're having. And I would explain to them and their answer would basically be, well, no, that's not what you're experiencing. And they were like, so I was the one having the experience, but they were claiming to be more of an authority on my experience than I was. And I was the one having the experience and they weren't. And that's the mom talk. And so in other words, to the extent that we can actually connect people with their intrinsic authority, you know, and instead of, for example, seeing, it's not even like we see ourselves through other people's eyes. No, we see ourselves through, he, through how we imagine other people see us. And that's radically different than just seeing through our own eyes and, you know, connecting with our own experience. That's why Buddha said, you know, don't take my word for it. Do the experiment yourself, you know, really go inwards and witness your own mind and see if what I'm saying is true. Be an empiricist, you know? Yeah. I think too, what comes to my mind to share, to kind of look at this slightly differently, but the same, you know, having studied everything to do with health and um, a lot to do with being a parent and raising children and healing kids. And Angie uh, is, you know, very deep into all this and she's a highly qualified shaman. But one of the things you see in a lot of the circles, especially some of the older writings, is that it's very important when a child is an infant, especially in the first few months, not to let sick people or unhealthy people handle the child or spend too much time around the child because they have the ability to suck the life force energy out of the child and children have a higher propensity of getting sick. And they say that you need to get, let, let the child have a few months to start building up its own life force and its own autonomy because it's been inside the womb as one with the mother. So just the same way we want a child surrounded by healthy, vital people while it's developing its systems and turning itself on, <clears throat> it seems to me that it's obvious we've got a lot of sick children in the world with regard to their capacity to use their mind to create what they want. And a lot of addicts in the world who are addicted to the very things that keep leading us down this path over and over again. So it seems that one of the things that people could do to heal is to look to who it is that we can say, you know, like the Dalai Lama really represents someone who's really got a mastery of what the mind is and what we can do with our mind and how to do it with the mind. And people like Eckhart Tolle, who lost his mind but learned how to work with the mind to create beauty. I think what I'm, I, I agree with everything you're saying. It's 100%, but I think that's a hard transition for people to make. It's like an addict trying to go cold turkey. It seems to me, you know, like podcasts like this where we give different perspectives, but it, it seems to me like what, what one of the things that we need to do to help the planet heal is we've got to give more airtime to people that have genuinely evolved and can understand and see. They're like a shaman that can look into the culture and say, this is why the sickness is here and this is what we've got to do. You know, what would Don Juan have to say right now, for example? So it seems to me like we've got to really be conscious enough to start spending more time connecting to the more evolved human beings that aren't out there to make billions of dollars and trick people. Right. Because that helps anchor us in someone that sees reality much more clearly than most people do. Or we keep falling back into the Watiko because we don't realize that we're doing it, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, a few things. So you mentioned um, Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle, Tolle and he, his big thing now, you know, so many people have been sending me, you know, he's talking about, oh, there's a mental virus and it's contagious and it's at the bottom of the collective psychosis. And people are saying, oh my God, it's like he's read your work. And, um, you know, he so, probably has. Yeah, yeah, probably. But, but the, the idea being that, you know, people, you know, joke or people have criticized me saying, oh, what you're saying is so out there. What I'm basically the out there thing I'm saying is that the source of our, madness is within our psyche which is so obvious 
And the that's so out there. <laughs> yeah, I know, totally, really. And it's so it's right it's so, in the mirror. There it is, out there. Yeah, See, there's right. me in the well, mirror. <laughs> well, and what Tico works by distracting us and thinking the problem and the solution is outside of ourselves. That's the way it works. But um, the thing you were saying, you know, because Watiko is also this like this vampire. So it, when you're, you know, we all have experience being around people, and afterwards we feel drained, like energetically. They're like, you know, compared to when you're around other people, and you feel, wow, I feel so uplifted and more energy and inspired. There's somebody who are like plugged into source, and you know, just they're radiating life force and love and compassion. But you know, that vampire archetype. When you're with somebody, because Watiko can literally possess a person and they will look like a human being, but they're unwittingly an instrument for, you know, the Watiko mind virus, you know, and it, it wants to propagate itself by, by enlisting other people and by draining other people's life force. But the other thing you were saying is that in, in Tibetan Buddhism, you know, the, the Sangha, the Buddha actually has a sutra where he says, basically, don't hang out with fools. In other words, be aware of who you hang out with. Because we affect each other. You know, when you hang out with people who are genuinely awakening, and a beautiful definition of bodhisattva is a being in the process of awakening, and who among us is not in the process of awakening. So just like we're these wounded healers and potential shamans in, in training, we're like all these bodhisattvas in training. And when we connect with other people who are also plugged in in that way, it helps all of us because we can all support each other and activate each other you know, and, and that's really the idea of Sangha. That's a real healthy family instead of like this dysfunctional family where power is abused and there's hierarchy. No, we're all in the soup together. We're all in the same boat. We're all completely equal. And to have that realization, I mean, that that is when you awaken in the dream, you see that, that everybody else is just a dream character in your dream and you're a dream character in their dream. And we're all just like these reflective mirrors of each other. Yeah, you know, what came to me as you were saying that is, is something interesting I want to share. Watiko seems to be really um, infects the ego more so than other parts of ourself. But the sangha is where you go to, to lose your ego. Think of a drum circle. If you're playing offbeat and making sure everybody can hear you, you stand out like a sore thumb and it's, Everybody in the room feels that disharmony is coming. But when you learn to relax into the circle, you can get to the point where you can feel everyone in the drum circle inside you like they're part of yourself. So what I feel that is probably the most important transition for healing the Watiko virus is that concept of the Sangha. Because when we sit together and we listen to each other without trying to force our opinion, but we have a dialogue. You know, David Bohm goes at length about the importance of dialogue and how there's not supposed to be a direction. You're not supposed to have your ego controlling it. You, you, you say, I'm in pain, and someone says, I'm in pain too, and someone says, let's dream a different way together. And someone says, I dream of our pain becoming our freedom. So you see, it takes its own flow without someone trying to force it and direct it. I, I, what I'm intuitively sensing is that one of the most important things that we can all do is turn off the television and start holding hands and singing and, and meditating and hugging and being with each other with the intention of saying, it's time for us to become creative together instead of a bunch of little independent brain cells we got to collectively create a brain together that has the only intention of healing growing and harmonizing together and that would be sort of the antidote for the watiko and its focus on consumption and threat and fear because when we come together we're like little fish that create a school that's big enough to scare the big fish away I just feel that it's really paradoxically time for us to shut off Anthony Fauci and Biden and all those types of people and go stand in parks and in dance halls and in meditation centers and just hold the orientation on what we can create together because it seems to be just the 
absolute medicine for the isolation, the victimization, the pressure. I, I don't know. Yeah, How yeah. do you feel well, about yeah, that? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. It's so funny because you're describing. So I don't know if you know. I mean, I have a whole community that's formed around me. I have all of these circles, all of these groups, and I actually have one soon. So I'm going to have to, you know, I'm cracking up going because we could talk for it, it's such a delight just hanging out with you, Paul. And I'm realizing, my God, we could talk for hours. But then I'm like, oh, my God, I have my group happening soon. I got to I got to go. But oh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're yeah. right at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and but the thing what you're saying, absolutely. I mean, for over 25 years, I've had this community, this group and, you know, of people who, who are awakening to the dream and who are coming together and exploring what it's like, you know, um, if we really took seriously and stepped into that point of view that this is a dream and we're actually dream characters in each other's dreams and we're actually co dreaming up together whatever's manifesting moment by moment and and yeah and it's that idea of sangha again that we can come together in a way and we can be together in a way and hang out with each other in a way that is super creative there's no technique there's no agenda we're just present to what's happening and, you know, the main channel we work with is the relational channel is being in relationship and, and, you know, and just talking out of our own experience, you know, so instead of telling another person what they're doing, we would be sharing what we're hallucinating they're doing. And we might, <laughs> we, might be totally, we might be totally tripping and projecting, or we might be seeing their blind spot and that's up to them to do the work and self-reflect. And, um, yeah. So, so anyway, so yeah, that's what it brought up. But I just want to say, I'm like so struck by just the incredible fun just hanging out with you. You know, this Me is. Me too. Been, yeah. I, I've been okay. waiting for you, man. He yeah, thought, as soon totally. as you said you were writing a new book, I said, good. I got another reason to hang out with him for a couple of hours. <laughs> right, right. And I have another one coming out in like a year. So we'll have to do this within, you know, a year from now. Yeah. Well, my new book should be out by mid time this year and you're one of the first people i'm going to share it with see if i can get a quote out of you <laughs> oh absolutely totally i would love that yeah i think you're gonna find it pretty interesting i'm uh i won't bore you with it now because you got to get going so anyhow paul what a i'm just so grateful for you you know i study a lot i practice a lot i really have devoted myself to my life and to doing the best i can do as a human being in my life and when I get to be with someone that I feel as, is as passionate for life and for people and for love and healing and growth as I am, I just feel like I feel like I've just been injected with with love and joy by just getting to talk to you. So thank you. Well, well, I appreciate that. But that's your that's your own projection. Just remember that. <laughs> well, it's working great. Don't stop it. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> I'm I'm smiling in the mirror. Let's not fix it. <laughs> right, right. Totally. Well, I appreciate that. Where can people find Watiko healing the mind virus that plagues our world? Okay. Well, uh, the, uh, the one hand, you know, any bookstore in in any of our multi galaxies, you know, or multi <laughs> all around, you know, and on Amazon. And if you if you want to to awaken in the dream, go to awaken in the dream.com that's my website you can buy autographed copies there um you know of that book or any of my books and um but a ton of free content just a lot of articles and interviews in this sense i just want to get this information out because it's it's medicine you know it is yeah and i love your articles you write great articles so well, thank you're you you're a great writer flat out man i just well, dig it thank I, you. I, if i can even get close to how good you write, I'll I'll be really happy. So I, you're an inspiration <laughs> wow. for me, man. Well I, well, I have to tell you one thing about that. When I went to college, I was really, you know, a good student, but I sucked at writing. It was my worst, you know, thing. And um, and then I, it blew my mind that I eventually became a writer. And I realized it was because I wasn't interested in what I was being forced to write about in school. But as soon as I had something to say, that I was passionate about, then I realized, oh, well, I found my voice. Yay. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree 100%. I think that's so true about so many aspects of our life. But I don't want to hold you up because I want you to be fresh for your group. So you've been such a gift 
and I can't wait for your next book. So I have a reason to interview you again. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's just, it's so, it's so awesome hanging out. Really. I just so appreciate you. Yeah. You're amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. Lots of love. And um, I'm excited to share this podcast. I really, I really think what we've done is just put our hearts on the table and hopefully everybody will get high off our our love and our awareness and our willingness to grow together. So uh, that's my gift and that's your gift. Well, it's so cool because I, what I appreciate, it was so, it was this natural, it was like we were hanging out in a coffee shop. It was just super spontaneous and, and alive. It wasn't scripted or like anything. We were just like tripping out together. And that's what I love. Yeah. To do, you know? Yes. So I'll close by saying thank you to all of you. I hope you really enjoyed the podcast and I hope you, really understand what Paul is sharing here. It's very important. And thank you for sharing the podcast. If you enjoyed it and you feel that there's medicine here, please share it with as many people as you can. And thank you to my sponsors. They're all beautiful people and they're really committed to sustainable practices and making very high quality products, or I wouldn't even begin to think of offering them to you. I have to sleep with myself at night. And, um, I really look forward to uh, sharing more with you guys. Um, and thank you for buying anything that you do buy from the sponsors because a little commission goes to support the podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a positive comment on iTunes. And um, I'd like to say we are safe. We are home. We are whole. Aho, great spirit. It is done. It is done. It is done. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Paul Levy. You can get Paul's latest book, Watiko, Healing the Mind Virus That Plagues Our World, at all good booksellers and on Amazon at amzn.to forward slash three uppercase M I seven C uppercase E lowercase D. Paul's new course, Breaking Free from the Spell of Wetiko to Heal the Mind Blindness that Plagues Our World, is now live on the Shift Network. Paul invites you to watch the free video event about this course at bit.ly forward slash Wetiko event. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash W-E-T-I-K-O-E-V-E-N-T. You can follow Paul on Facebook at paul.levy.9619 or visit his website at awakenindthedream.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Follow Paul Check on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at Paul Check, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living 4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chikiva.com.